Happy Thursday. It's time for coffee and cursey words. I have a pumpkin cream cold brew from Starbucks. Why did I go to Starbucks today? Well, it's Red Cup Day. Where'd my Red Cup go? It was here somewhere. I have so many cups on my desk right now. That's always the case. Red Cup Day. Very exciting. Um, that's always the case. I always have too many cups on my desk. Y'all know this. I love a cup. I love a water bottle. Oh, I have something to share. I forgot to grab it. It's here, though. It's here, though. <laughs> It's here though. I'm going to share this in a second. Anyway, today is time for a kind of decompression coffee and cursey words. We've all been through a lot, haven't we? It's just the last few days of covering the Daryl Brooks uh, Waukesha parade route massacre sentencing has been emotional uh, for, for all of us watching from afar. And even for those who weren't in this community, weren't directly impacted, I think that following this case has impacted impacted all of us as these cases that grab national news headlines do. We become invested in not just the the stories, but the people, and then how the justice system is playing out and what's happening in that system. And we all got to watch that uh, together. And it's quite, it's quite a lot. And we saw much less of it than the jury did, than the judge did. And that is something to keep in mind. So as we go through um, into, as we go through into today, it feels like we're playing Jeopardy and I'm like, you know, criminals who lack self-awareness for 200, because today we're going to be talking a bit about the Elizabeth Holmes sentencing that will be tomorrow. So we have a whole bunch of sentencing memorandums and some articles coming out statements on her behalf, et cetera, because that's in federal court, that's not going to be streamed, but we can get an idea of what people are going to say. It's going to be a different type of a sentencing Obviously, no one has been killed. We're looking at fraud cases. White collar crime is always treated a little bit different than your more traditional violent crimes. So with that, we are going to have a chat about it. But I've got some quick bits of, well, one quick bit of a news story. Why? Because it came across my news this morning and I was like, wait, really? So the Wash, <laughs> the Wall Street Journal had an interesting article this morning that we're going to chat about. And then we're going to get to Q&A. We had a lot of questions still lingering from the Brooks, tr Brooks trial. I will talk about those um, and we can talk about processing those during Q&A. It's just, um, it's just, well, it's not a skill you ever want to learn how to deal with trauma, but so many of us deal with trauma in our life and never learn how to deal with it. When I was a district attorney, I did not deal with it. Well, putting it in a little box and burying it deep, deep inside only works for so long. We we try it though. We try it though. And um and it doesn't always work well. Processing it is much more challenging, I have found, but processing it is necessary. And I think part of this community is to process it together. And um, and that's that's what matters. I the things I found very um, I don't know, uplifting about the if anything can be uplifting from a case that's so, so horrific is that the judge was able to, to give voice um, to the victims and honor them by kind of mirroring back what they had said, letting them know that they were heard, letting them know that what they had to say mattered, letting them know that she heard each and every one of them, that their statements made a difference to her um, and showing the emotion that so often, particularly women, are told to put away. I even saw, um, I, I've seen some comments, not from law nerds, from those that wander by and say shit on the internet and then leave, but comments of like, why are you crying? Or why are you using so many curse words? Or um, I hate seeing a professional woman be emotional. And I think that was directed at the judge, not at me, but whatever. It's so funny to still see some of that because I've moved so far beyond holding myself to those expectations that others might have because emotions make them uncomfortable. It was so validating to see a judge show compassion um, and not try to hide her compassion, not try to put on the mask and shove the tears back up into your face and not acknowledge that they exist. What happened is so tragic and sad. It rocked an, a community. It rocked, I think, a lot of us that had to watch um, children, children give impact statements about the injuries. And it was so 
cathartic for me to see another uh, professional woman not apologize and to be human. I think it's so needed. Um, and I just saw a comment in the chat that I resonate with so much. Jennifer said, a woman crying over murdered people is less acceptable than the rage of a man that killed people. It's it's the rage is what caught me in this comment, uh, Jen to the fur, because you're right. And I even found myself, while we were going through the impact statements, a little bit more comfortable with the yelling at Daryl Brooks, a little more comfortable with the rage um, that was being expressed. And it really made me take a step back and wonder why um, we have all been a little bit conditioned to be more familiar with rage than we are with sorrow, than we are with tears, and then we are with compassion. And it really stuck with me last night that I was more comfortable, even myself, being witness to anger than I was being witness to the deepest level of grief and sorrow. And I think that this case has allowed us a space to discuss that, to talk about that, and to talk about when you get past the anger um, and get into that deep sorrow that it can be uncomfortable because it's so real, it's so palpable, and it can be so hard to deal with. But I loved, loved is a, is a hard word. I just, I so deeply appreciated Judge Darrow for being human, for acknowledging that she was being human and being vulnerable, knowing that she would be criticized for showing emotion on the bench because women in law are so often criticized for showing emotion in any way. And it was very, very nice to see. And it was, it was just, I don't know, it was personally cathartic for me as someone who has cried in court during impact statements, who has cried reading impact statements, who has cried during testimony and has literally tried to hide from the jury as I'm crying during testimony of someone talking about the last time they saw their mother before they were murdered. You know, it it's human and it just resonated so deeply. And I think that being able to talk about grief in a safe space here and being able to say emotions aren't weakness to be able to be vulnerable enough in public to show your own pain is tremendously courageous. And it is much stronger than just showing the rage that is so easy to and comfortable to tap into. The hurt and the grief and the pain are so much harder and so much more raw and so much more vulnerable. And I appreciate the judge for showing that. She did show a little anger too. I found that cathartic as well. But it, and that's not, that's not to take away from those that showed rage. Their rage was palpable and deserved and necessary. And it's part of the way that they process. And I think acknowledging that everyone's allowed to process differently and none are more valid than others was just really, really impactful. And I appreciated it so much. And I hope as we cover more cases that we will be able to see the human side of the court system that is, you know, by no means perfect, but more often than not, justice is done. And I think that can get lost because the stories we too often hear about are the stories where justice is not done. And isn't it just as important to highlight the stories where it is? And that is really what I took away in processing this for myself, um, for myself yesterday. I mean, that and the fact that the judge has great hair and I really want to know how she kept her hair so great the entire time. I, these are, look, these are the questions that we all have, um, you know, your honor, but the hair, but how? And I really just appreciate um, all of you for not just bearing witness, but holding space um, for other, really other people's grief in a way that is very, very uncomfortable sometimes because it is so deeply painful. And I think everyone can see a bit of themselves in what happened in that court case in some way or another. So many of you shared that Daryl Brooks sound, sounded to you like abusive people in your own lives. 
shared that you resonated with the oldest child who was saying that she was trying to hold her family together or that her mother wouldn't be there or resonated with the moms who were frantically searching for their children or the kids who were marching in the band. So many of you found a connection to that story and remembering the human side of that story and not the courtroom antics of a murderer, I think is the takeaway for all of us as a community. And I appreciate you for walking through that with grace and compassion and humanity, because it's so much easier to be angry and to mock and to make fun. And, and all of you collectively, I think we all lost our minds a little bit when Daryl Brooks did say in his closing, he was going to take the high road. I think we all rolled our eyes a bit, which is completely appropriate. We should all just give it the biggest eye roll, you know, the kind that takes your whole head with it um, because it's deserved. So hopefully, even though it was it was difficult, um, I think it was important. And I try to pick cases that we're going to all learn something from. And a sovereign citizen pro per in a murder case is, is a unique thing. So thank you all for your humanity. Thank you all for, for just being good humans to each other on the internet. It's not always easy to do, especially when our anger is triggered. <laughs> It's not always easy. It's not always easy. And, and, and you did that. And the, the mods who held it down, thank you. It's not easy to not only sit through that, but also parse through, um, people's pain and make sure that we are keeping our, um, our community, a safe space to have these conversations. So thank you. Thank you all of you, because it's not really me. The community here is incredible because of you and because you're here, because you will all take a deep breath with me and go, okay, we just, we need mittens. We need mittens. <laughs> we need, we need a pint sized version of fuck around and find out. We're going to, we're going to talk about bobcats being in the yard and me being from California and knowing not much about nature. We need it. We need it. And, um, and being able to make that switch too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get into today. We're going to talk about some lighter topics. And then, and then we're back to criminals that lack self-awareness, really. I mean, we're we're back to that today. Cause because we're back to that today. I should roll the intro. It's been a very long intro. Replay crew, we love you. Thank you. Timestamps will be down below. Um, let me know where you're coming in from and what you're drinking. It's good to see everybody today. I appreciate you. It's just, it's just so much gratitude so much gratitude and, and for you. And then, you know, for the community of Waukesha for letting us all bear witness to, to how much good happened in the wake of such a horrific tragedy and how much community and that there really was, you know, outside from the callous act of Daryl Brooks, there was a lot of, of community coming together to heal together. And that's an incredible thing to see. And we don't always get to see it. So thank you for letting us also be there um, as you walk through it. So thank you for coming in. Let's roll the let's roll the intro. Let's do it. Let's do the things. Hey there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker, the badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator. I'm the host of The Emily Show, and I break down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years but this is not legal advice. I should warn you, I'm a big fan of the cursey words. This channel is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not fuckery. Okay, we're going to do some quick bits. The first one is a story near and dear to my heart that came across my Apple News feed this morning. Yes, I use Apple News. It's part of like, Apple just charges us for things I don't even know. <laughs> But we get the like, we get the the workout ones, which I really, really like. And then I get the news and then we get other things. It's part of what our, whatever, Apple One or whatever the hell they call it, that package. And with that, um, I I tend to look, maybe it's not the greatest way to start the morning, but I tend to look at Apple News first thing in the morning um, and take a look at kind of what news stories they are looking at. Sometimes it is world news, sometimes it is not. Um, this one I think the algorithm has targeted me appropriately. Thank you to our robot overlords for knowing exactly who the fuck I am. Um, 
because this is what happened this morning from the washing uh the wall street journal i i didn't know the wall street journal was into like culture reporting but here we go from the wall street journal for our first little quick bits um the new office status sim status symbol has a lot of water and has a lot and has a wait list only slightly smaller than hockey stanley cup the supersized stanley quencher water bottle has become the desktop trophy for the casual hybrid workplace what what did i stumble into a trend with my deep and unhealthy obsession of water bottles is that what happened did i are we trendy I don't know. I found the Stanley mugs because of the Starbucks collab. And then I needed this one. And then this one wasn't quite big enough. And then I needed this one and got a text from my husband that literally said, Emily, WTF is this? I'm that, what, what, what is, what? Did we stumble into a, a trend? I, what is happening? Why does the Wall Street Journal know about my cups? Leave my cups alone. Also, I might, I might or might not have this. I don't still have this purse, but I love that they used a well-worn one. That's not a new one. But what? 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 The Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal has like the the basic bitch office wear here, except we need a fancier Apple Watch and not a little Gucci watch. Like that watch is way too way too uh, delicate and sweet for me. Also, um, I'm a woman of a certain age. I can't read that watch. Like who? who Who's able to see that all the way down on their wrist? Not me. Let's continue on. Um, Kalen Brochers, thank you, sir. We appreciate you because you, you have seen into our soul. <laughs> the, oh no, I have to sign in. I'm going to have to go pull it. Hold on. I'll go pull it from Apple because that's the thing about the Apple news is it pulls the stories without the paywall. So we're going to just go grab it from Apple News. Let's see if I can just share that window from Apple News. Yep, yep, yep. I thought I could be clever. And then the internet was like, no, you can't. No, you can't. You're going to have to just switch back and forth to different streams. Um, let's make sure that I am switching to the right window. Oh, that's not the right window. Hmm. All right, give me a second as I switch windows because that's not easy to do. I wish StreamYard would let me populate like three different tabs at once. It would be so nice. All right, there it is. All right, the Wall Street Journal. Back again from uh, Apple News. Click, click, do the clicky things. Oh, there's ads. All right, put the Jimmy Choo shoes and the Armani suits back in the closet. I assure you, I assure you, I assure you that I never rolled to work in any of those things. <laughs> never, not once, not even a little bit, not even ever, not even a little bit. The new on the job status symbol is a tumbler only slightly smaller than hockey's Stanley cup. It is really big. It's really big. It's really big, real big, real, real big. Um, and nearly as valuable to some, sometimes going for two or three times its retail price on the secondary market. I did not buy these on the secondary market, but I'm not going to say I have never bought a Starbucks cup on the secondary market. It has happened. They do go for two to three times the retail price. This desktop trophy allows its owner to flaunt a combination of trendiness, disposable income, and presumably bladder control. Yes, I am flaunting my bladder control. I am regularly as a streamer. I went to the bathroom once yesterday in a six hour stream. I didn't know that was something to flaunt, but I'm going to take it. <laughs> Which is why this article is our quick bit for the day. Because, because bladder control after having two kids is worth flaunting. <laughs> it is also 40 ounces of water. So I get it. But let, but let us continue. But let us continue. Stanley, a century-old brand that you might associate with grandpa's camping gear, uh, reports the wait list for its 40-ounce drinking vessel peaked at 150,000 customers earlier this year after millennial women with large social media followings helped repopularize it. I'm definitely not a millennial. I am a zennial, which is a strange, weird 
micro generation in between X and millennial. So it is Zennial with an X, but there's also a Zennial with a Z, which is the weird cuspy generation, um, younger generation between millennial and Gen Z. So Zennials, um, I'm the older Zennial, but this is so large, so large, so large. The 40 ounce, I might need the gray in the 40 ounce. Um, what's so funny is this one actually fits in my cup holder better because of the height of the cup holder bit. This one sits down too far. So, um, let's see. Let us, let us go. Uh, um, KCD said Zennial with a Z here. Hey friend. Hey friend. Hey friend. All right. Also X Zennial. Us ex zennials I think the zennials and the zennials get along really well. I think we all kind of see it. I think we're all just like, yep, we're here. We're here. Um, I'm 79. Am I a zennial? Yes. Yes, you are. I'm 78. I'm a zennial. It's it's the end, the end tail end of of um of Gen X, because a lot of a lot of the tail end of Gen X, like we had the Gen X things, but we also we had the internet sooner. And we really started into some of the early millennial things. Like, you're not going to tell me that I, I, you know, we have a lot of the, um, a lot of the kind of similarities there with the older, with the elder millennials. We appreciate the emo. We also appreciated the boy band trends. We also grew up without the internet, but then we had AOL chat rooms by the time we were late teens. And so we kind of are in that weird cuspy that weird cuspy uh, end bit where the older generation of Gen X is like, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't have a computer until later in life. I wasn't on like the earliest forms of social media, but we all still played Oregon Trail. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about Zennials, Millennials and more um, in another, in another chat, in another chat. I also think, you know, it just depends. I'm 85. I say I'm an elder millennial and you're right there in the elder millennial zennial cusp. But a lot of the elder millennials had, again, the internet being a huge factor in these generations had internet access much younger than those of us that are zennials that were late, late teens. Um, and a lot of the, the zennials didn't have the same MySpace type <laughs> in uh, the same MySpace type uh, engagement because we were just a little bit older as it was growing more with the millennials, they were younger as that was coming up. So let us, let us continue with the, the trendy millennial women, um, with social media followings. I've not seen, I've not seen this mug. I've not seen this once on social media. Maybe it's, maybe it's because social media is showing me other things lately. I have not seen this once on social media and now I'm disappointed. Um, because I saw another, another local mom had one and I was like, oh, it's got a handle. I need one. She was like, yes, it's great. I'm like, yes, I need one. So anyway, so, uh, where were we? Sales this year are up 275% compared with last year. Look, those Starbucks collabs worked. Lonnie, who asked, did you have AOL though? Yes. I lived for an AOL chat room, but I also used CompuServe. <laughs> Look, I'm not surprised sales are up, but those Starbucks collabs reintroduced me to Stanley and I was like, this is the greatest freaking coffee mug ever. I don't care. This coffee mug is the greatest goddamn coffee mug I have ever seen. It It's perfect and it's perfect to drink on stream because it's, it's large, but it's not, damn it. It's large, but it's not deep. It's girthy. So when you drink your coffee, you're not like upending it forever and then it doesn't splash. It's just the perfect freaking coffee mug and it looks like a pot of coffee. It's so great. So the Starbucks collab last year got, got, got me deep into the Stanley world. And then I started looking around. And so now we've got like literally the size of my head. So let us continue. Uh, Rob, I see you dying in the chat. It's fine, Rob. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so let us continue. Let us continue. Ah, that's not the way I wanted to go. Let us continue. Um, the Stanley coffee mug I love, I've linked on Amazon, but also the Stanley website, I think it's just stanley.com. Let me take a look real quick. I think it's just stanley.com. Um, 
Y'all are going to go sell out some water bottles. Look, not an affiliate link, not an, oh no, it's definitely not Stanley.com. That's from Black & Decker. Hold on. <laughs> the wrong kinds of tools. Still exciting. I love a tool, but uh, the wrong kind of tools. It's Stanley 1913 here. Well, I'll just put their link to their website because, you know, if you want, if you want Stanley cups, if you're like, I need this, look, put it under the tree for someone who loves cups. It's time. They should sponsor you. I don't think they need to. <laughs> They're like, we can't keep up with demand at all. We're good. <laughs> Wait, is Rob okay? No, Rob, Rob has fallen over um, with me making all of the jokes. I have stacks of cups on this desk, Rob. I we would summon you. Dix has them too. Of course, Dix has them too. REI has them too. So you can find them at a lot of sporting goods. They used to be um, they used to be just they I think I think everybody had all the Yeti cups. And then everybody had all the hydro flasks. And then like the Gen Z took over the hydro flask with the like viscose whatever shit. And so I feel like the the dignified elder generation was like, fuck it, we need our own thing. <laughs> like the Yetis are for like boat life uh, and camping maybe. And then I don't know. I don't know how the trend shifted from Yeti. You can only buy so many. You can only buy so many Yetis. And the handle, the handle is what makes it for me. The handle does it for me. I love this thing. All right. This this was not meant to be me pitching you on why you needed a Stanley mug. You don't. It's ridiculous. But they're great. <laughs> Bought two Stanley cups in the last two weeks because of EDB. I'm sorry. They don't have the bright pink one. I didn't get it that long ago. So you might be able to find it at REI or similar. All right. Where were we? Um, the waiting list for the 40-ounce drink, drinking vessel. It really is a vessel. It's not a cup. Dr. B, it's not a cup. It's a vessel. <laughs> Peaked at 150,000 customers earlier this year. Um, sales are up 275%. The figure doesn't count resells on websites like Poshmark. Rhonda Jar, Google's head of talent outreach partnerships in North America. Rhonda, we need to be friends. Hello, Google's head of talent outreach. I'm talent. Reach me. Um, head of talent outreach partnerships in North America says Instagram led her to covet a sold out quencher, but she couldn't bring herself to spend a hundred dollars plus, uh, commanded by people trying to flip theirs for profit. She waited for a restock, pounced on one at face value, and now relishes the admiring banter that ensues when she takes a sip on video calls. Look, look at this beautiful cup. The aesthetic. Can we just take a minute? The fucking aesthetic is flawless. I'm living for all of it. Look at this coffee. Can we just, can we just? Also, why is it 7.14 a.m.? I never want to be at my desk that early, but, but the aesthetic with the cream color cup that is in stock at the moment, and then the glass coffee. I have a smaller version of this cup, the cappuccino one I was drinking yesterday. I feel like Rhonda and I are meant to be friends. The aesthetic is flawless and I love it. Vibes. <laughs> Vibes, it's vibes, and I'm here for it. Here for it. Relishes the admiring banter that ensues when she takes a sip on video calls. I am not sipping enough on video calls. I'm going to start just doing all my video calls like this. Hi, I have a cup. <laughs> the coffee matches the wall hanging. It matches everything. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. I have Yeti and Stanley. Stanley absolutely keeps things warmer or colder. Colder is big for me, much longer than Yeti. Look, I'm carrying this to a football game tomorrow. It's absolutely happening. Um, I have a drinking, <laughs> water drinking problem. I drink four, uh, four to five 40 ounce bottles a day. That's fantastic. I'm not going to tell you not to. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Not me ordering a 40 ounce Stanley. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. That's a desk of a person who isn't working. I think that's a desk of a person who knows a photo's being taken. And so everything else has gotten shoved to this side or on the floor down over here because I've done that too. But I also need a clear, I need a clear desk. Um, and almost all of my work is on the computer. I need a clear desk to think. So I clear things out to the side and literally my desk is here and then I will dump stuff in piles on the back side of my desk. So you'll never see it. <laughs> I need it out of my line of sight too. So let's see. Um, I'm so... <laughs> I'm sorry. This was this was just supposed to be lighthearted fun. I wasn't supposed to trigger all of you into cup need. I get it. I get it. It was $30 on Amazon yesterday and 65 plus today. This article came out this morning. 
this article did come out this morning. So the Amazon resellers are on it. You might be able to get it at the same price from the Stanley website. All right. Let us continue um, after we have fawned over Rhonda Jar, Google's head of talent outreach partnerships office. Um, just one thing could increase her satisfaction. I'm fully remote. So sadly, I don't get the chance to status signal to coworkers in person, she says. <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. Me neither. The notion of a status water bottle, laughable just a few years ago. Oh, no. Don't tell him about the craze for the Starbucks cups because though they are not a water bottle, they are a cup. And the status symbol over hunting for Starbucks cups has been going on for years. For years. Chat, Rashida, thank you. Rashida has got your back, chat. Lowe's. Look, these are work cups. These are work cups. I'm not surprised they're at Lowe's. Rashida, thank you. The, this is this is the community we all need today. Where to buy these cups? Um, Whole Foods also had a Stanley display for the longest time, but earlier this year, when he's went nuts, that display quickly disappeared. It probably got sold out and they couldn't restock it. Um, so I found the 40-ounce cup in pink at REI for $40. There you go. There you go. There you go. Um, Starbucks cups are gorgeous. How many MLS... Is 40 ounces. I'm going to let the chat do the conversions for you. I would have to ask Siri. I don't, I don't know. My public sells them also. They're all over the place. They're all over the place. There you go. I saw it for $72 on Amazon two seconds ago. Don't do that. That's too much. The craze will die back down and you'll be able to get them. I've been trying to find the holidays tumblers. I have 400 stars I've been saving. They are, they have been hard to find. Um, these are a great way these are a great way to uh, to get somebody who needs it. Um, Lowe's, my hubby needs one of those. It holds a lot. Suggestions. Um, he uses that huge keg looking one. Those are pretty good. Those are pretty good. These, I think, only go up to 40. But Stanley also has the giant jug looking ones. The bands, all the band kids around here use them. Um, you guys, the chat's keeping you apprised on where to buy things. Are the Stanley's leak proof in a backpack? I have had very good luck because it has a little thing on the top where you can take the straw out and turn it around. I've traveled on a plane with it, and I have not had a problem with it. I have not tried to lay it all the way down for extended periods of time, but I've traveled with this, um, well, actually the gray one, on the plane, and it was fine. So I haven't had a problem with it. So, yep. So, um, Sylvia, Emily, my name is Sylvia, and I have a Starbucks cup problem. It's not a problem. It's a, it, We're collectors. Look, people collect baseball cards, and nobody tells them they have a problem. I went to Disneyland on Monday just to get the red and green cup. I support you. I think that's a brilliant plan. And if you get two, you can resell one of them. Tervis makes good tumblers. I mean, everybody had the Tervis for a while. The thing is, we just need, um. sometimes we just need change. <laughs> is this a paid endorsement? No, this is me fawning all over these cups that I've been loving for weeks and then seeing the Wall Street Journal also say that they're a thing. No, if it was a paid endorsement, it would have been 60 seconds that I would have told you. We never, we never hide our endorsements. This is just me being ridiculous with my love of cups because we've been talking about it. Is it normal that I only use my Starbucks stars for cups? Yes, that's what I do too. It's the best value for your stars. Absolutely. Just got the hot pink one on Amazon for 40 bucks. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, chat, let's continue. Many traditional markers of style and success. Think designer handbags and Swiss watches are either off camera during Zoom meetings or seem overly dressy in offices that are more laid back than before the pandemic. I didn't realize the pandemic had shifted us all to our, yes, I did. It shifted us all to our best sweatpants life. Look, I don't know if you had to make me go to an office now and I couldn't wear like a Grogu sweatshirt from Old Navy, I would probably lose my mind. Like I'm just not doing it. I'm just not doing it. What's the point of buying Italian wool trousers? Never has been something I've worried about in my life. If the new uniform, um, if denim is the new uniform or $800 pair of heels, if you aren't going to strut or out of the, <laughs> strut onto the company elevator and savor envious glances. I don't really care about the envious glances. I like things that make me smile when I pick them up. I really do lean into my own joy and I just don't. Does this bring me joy when I look at it on my desk? Yes. Therefore, I'm going to share it with you. Um, do I really care if other people, if it brings them joy? No, not everybody likes cups the way I do. I'm ridiculous. Um, just like my, um, I made the Kessel Run magnet 
on the back of the car. We have one of the Disney, I made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Things that make me happy. I tend, y'all, I'm highly motivated by whether it makes me giggle. And if it makes me giggle and I look at it and go, I like it, that's how we make decisions around here. We lean into the joy. I spent years caring about what other people think. I give none of the fucks anymore. And I just lean into the squee of the thing. Is it soft? Do I like it? Does it does it make me go? And if it does, then then that's what it is. Um, we may be working, dressing, and accessorizing differently, but we still like to preen. I mean, that can be true. The COVID era helped elevate a cachet of humble items such as hoodies, fanny packs, and baseball caps. The fanny packs are everywhere. You can't avoid the fanny packs. Everyone loves a fanny pack. We all just got tired. And it's like, look, it's right there. I can just pull my cards out. We all, we all love a fanny pack. We all love a fanny pack. We do. Lean into joy. It's just, just who cares about, about the rest of it? I mean, really. I mean, really. Um, he who dies with the most giggles wins. I think it's fair. Oh my God, gotta get that Kessel Run thing for my mom. She would love it. It's at, it's probably on the Disney website as well. Um, let's see. We may be working, dressing, and accessorizing differently, but we still like to preen. The COVID era helped elevate a cachet of such humble items as hoodies, fanny packs, and baseball caps. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I feel I feel very seen. Here comes the four-pound kettlebell of drinkware. <laughs> when it's full, it really is. Look, it's a workout. <laughs> I weighed mine full on a kitchen scale with a fantastical logo. It features a winged bear wearing a crown, a grizzly griffin, a griziffin. I'm here for it. Look, the logo is pretty fantastic. I'm not mad about it. It is, in fact, a bear with wings wearing a crown. <laughs> he's he's a bear superhero. Quencher fans say they love its ability to keep drinks hot or cold and that it fits into a car cup as a holder despite the Mondo size. That's key. Cup holder is key. If you don't fit well into my cup holder, you are dead to me. Um... Others say it's overhyped. I mean, that's also fair. It can be both. It can be both. People who don't love cups are like, the hype is ridiculous. And people who do love cups are like, but it's the perfect one. It's the perfect one. I have found my precious. I love this one. I love this one. And it you can use it with or without a star. Love. It goes on to say it's the Patagonia vest of water bottles, says Allie Nix, a 31-year-old marketing account director in Boston of the popular fleece zip-up hoodies, sometimes derided as bro vests. I mean, no lies. Strategically positioned in your webcam frame or perched on a conference table, the quencher is bound to draw reactions like the ones from Axel Dean Loosely says he received when he was debuting his overgrown mug at work this month. Oh, you got one? I want one. <laughs> I didn't know this was a thing. I don't work in an office. And then it goes on to talk about all of those who want these mugs on and on. Listen to this. Um, Stanley President Terrence Riley is a connoisseur of improbably cool products, having been the chief marketing officer at Crocs. Imagine that I've gone from Crocs <laughs> to Stanley and we're just taking things that other people think are dorky and we're making it amazing. And I love that. He confirms that women are largely responsible for the Renaissance at Stanley. Look, that Starbucks collab man, a historically male focused company. They now drive roughly half of water bottle sales. I think that's why we're seeing so many fun colors. What we're seeing is a return to office trend of matching their quencher to their outfit. Dr. B, we're, we're getting more cups. We're getting more cups. Women are using this as an accessory, so they're purchasing more than one. He adds that it's taken several months for manufacturing and distribution to catch up to the demand and insists that the company isn't employing a scarcity model. Scalping is flattering, he says, as our Facebook groups in which thousands of members swap supposed tips about new releases. Still, the company wants to be able to sell to everyone who wants to buy, especially as holiday shopping seasons begin. So just know that Stanley will be replenishing the mugs. Oh, wait, this one's this one's on the website right now. The $50 sticker price on the newest lineup features a soft matte finish who whose feel Mr. Riley likens to a hug. I don't Mine doesn't feel like a hug yet. I need one. I need one. Um, 
technically magic says I popped off on many a cocky frat bros wearing the Fratagonia vests. I mean, it's fair. It's fair. Um, up here and sniggering at the use of the word fanny. That's totally fair too. International crew. Jenny Chenoweth, Jenny Chenoweth told me she has been hopping, hoping to find a quencher under the tree this Christmas. Um, I wrote to the 51 year old founder of core consulting, a Seattle recruiting business after stumbling on a LinkedIn post from nine months ago, which she declared, I need one of these. I love that they're on LinkedIn talking about this. I need, I'm not on LinkedIn much, but I love that that's what they're doing. Um, when we first connected last week, she still hadn't snagged one, even though she's done some recruiting for Stanley's parent company, HAVI, adding to her frustration, a business associate recently recently flashed a quencher on a video call. Of course, I was jealous of her, Miss, Miss Chenoweth. They are not sold out. Go to the website. The two tumblers arrived. Then two tumblers arrived at her doorstep. Santa hadn't come early. She'd ask Stanley for permission to speak on the record, and the company sent her a pair. They're like, we've got you. It's fine. <laughs> the light pink one is fire. The light pink one is fire. It's fire. It's fire. Um, I love my Starbucks travel mugs a lot, despite not being a big fan of Starbucks coffee. Their mugs are great. I need blingy ones. They might need blingy ones. Um, but can you stack them? Not well. I'm amazed LinkedIn is a thing. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is a huge thing. <laughs> Emily D. Baker, our lady of the cups. Yes. 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 Um, and yes, Lucinda, the Americans are aware that fanny pack is a weird, is a weird turn of phrase for all of the international crews that don't use fanny to mean bum. Some of the companies that have a more international audience has started calling the fanny packs that we, that we are used to bum bags for a reason. <laughs> but, Jamila, I haven't seen a black one yet. They need a black on black on black. They need a blacked out one, just like the blacked out facts hat. Y'all, I wanted to show you this and then we're going to move on to like more serious topics. But um, I needed a giggle and the Wall Street Journal acknowledging my cup addiction made me laugh this morning. And so I was going to share that laugh with all of you because don't we need a laugh? I um, We relaunched the facts hat, this one that I'm wearing, with the 3D facts in um, the 3D facts black on black. But we added, this was per the law and herd's request and suggestion. We added the back that says not fuckery. So the new fax hat, you can either get it with or without the fax not fuckery. So that's what I wanted to show you. We also have the purple, but they sent my purple wrong. The purple is beautiful, but when they sent me my mine, they did not send it 3D. So this is also 3D on the purple fax hat. So with that, we have facts that we have, we have, we have the new facts with the not fuckery on the back. I can't wait. Wait, the Stanley website has a black one. Kathy says, hold on. Wait, we're going to shop together. <laughs> let's just, let's just, oh, that's not the right page. Oh, I've got to sh change my screen share. That was still my Apple news. No Apple news. No, no. I need my other, I need my other one. Um, Charles. Fanny does not mean bum around the world. It it means um, uh, uh, private bits. Yep, that that's a good way to describe that. <laughs> um, Jimmy, okay, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking. I I haven't seen the black one. Hold on, we're go we're sharing together. Share screen. Um, let's go. So let's see. And a stream. Okay, let's look. Where are they? Mugs and cups. They have other cool shit. I'm not going to say it's just the mugs. Like, I love the other stuff too. But, like, this is fire. But I'm never going to use a 12 ounce cup for anything. I mean, look at the, the beer steins are super cool. Okay, hold on. We're not shopping for Emily, focus. You're looking for a particular series what are we looking for we're looking for no those are collections we're looking for these where are these are they underwater bottles maybe they're underwater bottles yep all right it's this is a cup to me not a water bottle so this is the 40 ounce there's the soft matte 40 ounce wait maybe it isn't black i was wrong there it is there we go Ooh, even the straw's a little bit darker that's fun the gray's kind of fun the cream is lovely. 
the fog is this color that I adore. Um, and then we got the eucalyptus. Rose quartz is cool. And then the pink one. I think I need to get a soft touch one. These soft matte ones. But I want some other colors. I don't know. Dune is kind of fun. Red rust. But we'll see. I need to go. We'll go shopping later. This, the 30 ounce one is the one this one is. And then look, they've got the, the also like the bucket style ones, which is kind of cool. So some of the bigger, like the 64 this just screams band practice to me, um, but band mom. And then some of these are sold out. Some of these limited edition uh, first releases. So there we go. We've now explored and answered the question. It does, in fact, come in black, which, you know, we love and not sold out on the website at the moment. All right. Let us continue. <laughs> <laughs> just bought the rose quartz and you can also find them you can find different different varieties if you're looking for like the bright pink people have said that they still have them on the uh distributors so like dicks and uh rei and stuff like that so have fun have fun look none of us got taylor swift tickets we might as well get our coveted according to the wall street journal fucking mugs like this is here um do we think let's let's talk about Ticketmaster and taylor swift for just a moment I have raged about Ticketmaster more than once, mostly in relation to Dave Matthews Band tickets because Dave Matthews Band tickets, because of the amount of fees that are attached, because of the fact that there is nowhere else and you are stuck. And for certain um, events for Dave, I have been stuck in line forever. And then it just like disappears, like the queue just fucking disappears and you're just like, meh. But it might be the Swifties that actually take down Ticketmaster, and I am here for it. I'm here for it. Taylor Swift had to cancel multiple tours because of a pandemic and, and released multiple, multiple albums uh, during said pandemic. But some of y'all, nine hours to get tickets. Like, I what? And the fees feel predatory. So... I think we're going to see a lot of conversation, not just in um, not just in Congress, but with artists. At what point as an artist are you frustrated that your community is having a miserable experience trying to get um, trying to get tickets? Like it's just at what point do you say enough is enough? And there are enough Swifties to just take down Ticketmaster. And we've also seen members of Congress asking questions like, hey, maybe this merger with Live Nation was, you know, a bad idea, though we all said that when they went to merge with Live Nation. Because what is an artist supposed to do? There is no, absolutely no option. Law and Lumber, the Ticketmaster stuff has me agreeing with people on Twitter that surprises me. Because everyone's kind of on the same page that Ticketmaster is an evil monopoly and there's nothing to do. There's no way. They have virtually 100% of market share for large concerts. Yes, they might not have a small venue down the road. But when you look at these mega tours from everyone to like a Springsteen, I think Dave Matthews, but those aren't stadium tours uh, in the same way that a Taylor Swift concert, a BTS concert, that these massive stadium tours are, um, there's no option. There's no other option but Ticketmaster. And um, Pearl Jam tried. Pearl Jam absolutely tried. Pearl Jam absolutely tried. And the Department of Justice was just like, eh. But maybe there are enough people in Congress that are actually Taylor Swift fans that something will fucking happen. Maybe. Maybe. Um, just Sarah, do we even need Ticketmaster anymore? I don't know. I don't work with, I've never worked within the music industry. I don't know. I don't know why the venues can't do it on their own. And I don't know if, I don't know what the problems are. I don't know what the problems are to, um, I don't know what the problems are or the, 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 uh, what is, what is the purpose that Ticketmaster serves between the venue 
the artist and the fan. Like what is what is needed? Lawn Lumber said, give the girl credit. She made Apple feel some pain. Taylor Swift has regularly, Taylor Swift has regularly tried to push forward all artists. Um, I mean, Metallica absolutely took it to took it to Napster and LimeWire and and others. Taylor Swift took it to Apple with regard to streaming rates. The artists and their communities have the power to do this. It's not the artist alone. It's the community and attention that they demand. So um, Sarah said it's not the artist, it's the record label. And that might be part of the, the um, that might be part of the conversation. So it's something I'm going to be looking at. We've been, I've been talking about wanting to do a deep dive into Ticketmaster for like six months. So it's time. It's time. Um, t I'm seeing Taylor Swift tickets in the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. So many venues have exclusivity deals with Ticketmasters, but who else could they have a deal with? Like who else? Venues in Canada are owned by Live Nation, right? Who's part of Ticketmaster? So who else do you deal with? They're mad we're not sleeping outside their offices anymore. <laughs> so they're going to make us all feel the pain. And then they don't deal well with the resale market. How is the resale market getting so many tickets? What is happening that the people waiting for five, six, seven plus hours are not able to get tickets, but there are so many up on resale immediately? What's happening there? And how do artists deal with it? I think Taylor Swift tried to deal with it by the presale, but then presale codes weren't working. People were getting locked out and having difficulty. And and who, I mean, I love that some of y'all got tickets. I would wait nine hours for tickets too. I totally would. I have waited longer for an iPhone um, because I, w I will absolutely. But um, what is the option if you can't have more money? I, to buy on the resale market? I don't know. Why Why is it taking so long? Lois Lane, I know Garth's tickets are going on sale Monday. I don't stream on Mondays, which I'm very thankful for. Um, I would love to see Garth again. It's been a really long time since I've seen Garth. So yes, it's going to be a nightmare. The last time Garth tickets went on sale, it was a nightmare. Um, L Johnson said, I got tickets, was in queue for six hours and was terrified I was going to get kicked out the whole time. $65 in fees per ticket. Yep. I saw tickets for 50 thousand dollars and the thing is casey somebody will pay it somebody will pay it um they keep artists from reaching their fans fucking sucks i'm giving up hope seat geek is an option seat geek is an option but seat geek is resale so you you have to accommodate for the resale i saw vegas floor tickets for ninety four thousand dollars i'm sticking to my 50 dollar status symbol cup over here y'all um, Ticketmaster is a dinosaur holdover. Can should be reworked. Exactly. Exactly. BravoCon fees were insane. Yes, they were. BravoCon fees were absolutely insane. I get tickets through the Dave Matthews Band fan club. I do too. Difficult if you can't pay far out in advance, but I shouldn't have to pay to join a fan club to get tickets. Natasha, I don't always get my tickets through the warehouse. Even though I try, there have been times I have gotten skunked by the warehouse. You and Hogue could do a collab on Ticketmaster. I'm down. I'm down too. We need to pull in somebody who knows the music industry better. And I think we can do that. Um, Baxter said, as a venue manager, it is very much ease of use. Ticketmaster has the sales program. It's hard to program the software and the venue then can focus on a lot more than organizing on the show side, which is fair. Don't forget the credit companies play a role. I mean, I don't know if they can change what Ticketmaster, Ticketmaster does. Um, and I don't know how Ticketmaster can deal with the the reseller side too but um i hope need <laughs> where's the bodies garth i don't i don't know need to go back to in-person sales that would be interesting tickets are already for sale on third-party sites so frustrating they were people were starting to offer them before uh they were so um d audrey said in south africa we call fanny packs moon bags i love that can we just all adopt that name they are they're moon bags so anyway, that's my rant about Ticketmaster. We need to do a deep dive. I'm sure that I'm sure there will be a class action. I'm sure there will be a class action. I will keep you guys posted on Twitter too if I see stuff about it. If there is, so that you can um, that you can do that. So, 
Hey, Swifties, at least you have time before your concert and you're not given literally a three-day warning and tickets going on sale for a month out. Y'all can plan to fly somewhere. That That is fair. That is fair. Jen T said, after my nine hours, I bought six tickets um, regarding sold out to the extra four for only 25 more per ticket to ensure I didn't lose money, but I wanted others to have a fair shake. That's very fair. Um, Vegas tickets are a thing all their own. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Let's see. <laughs> This discussion is making me feel better about my day. Lex, the Swifties are angry. We can have comfort cups. <laughs> and we're changing the name of bum bags and fanny packs to moon bags. 90000 for a nobleys. Somebody's joking on that. Somebody's joking on that. No one's paying that. Don't forget Ticketmaster does the same to sports ball as well. They are disgusting for the excessive fees they charge. Yes, I just haven't had as much experience trying to buy sports ball tickets. So I try to stick to the experience I have, which is music. Um, cause I don't try as much. Oh, they do also have dynamic pricing. I forgot about that. They do do the dynamic pricing. I was so pissed when they did the dynamic pricing, trying to buy tickets to see Dave in Vegas. It was ridiculous. It was like, oh, more people want these. Let's, let's raise the price. Um, motherboard wrote an article and did a live stream discussing what's going on with Ticketmaster. I will look. It's the same with, I know Rob is covering it. I'm sure that Hogue is covering it and others about the um, the XTX or the FTX crypto stuff. I have been so busy with other stuff. And if you have listened to all of my rage in the podcast that came out yesterday, the video will be out today, but the podcast that um, came out yesterday, I've been covering a lot of the Girardi stuff. I have not had time to keep up with the amazing crypto scandal that's going on right now, but I know that others in this space are covering it. So question what is dynamic pricing it's like it's like uber surge pricing the more people waiting to buy tickets the higher the price goes it's demand pricing i guess um ftx bankruptcy filing today omg um law and lumber if you're covering it let everybody know when you're covering it Ticketmaster better have this figured out before beyonce goes on tour i have adult money now and i i intend to spend it unwisely Spending money on an experience that you love, Tiana, is always a wise choice. We only get one life. Money doesn't come with us. Go see Queen Bay and do it. Like it just, it, it that's the wisest, I think. For me, it's the wisest way to spend your money because it's a memory of a lifetime and the joy of a live concert is unparalleled. Um, Thank you, Mama C, for the prayers to our mod, Ashley Vincent. Ashley is absolutely incredible. She shared with us yesterday that today was her last radiation treatment. She's in all of our thoughts. All right. Let's talk about, oh yeah, between Taylor Swift fans and Beyonce fans, they're going to absolutely take down Ticketmaster. I love, I'm here for it. Look, something needs to happen. Something needs to happen. Um. All right. Let us, let us go. Let's see. Um. Hi, IED. Yes, we should all sue. <laughs> That's the class action. Ticket, everyone who feels per personally victimized by Ticketmaster. <laughs> Raise your hand. The distress caused by Ticketmaster is real. Like, is real. Is real. Um, so, DE said, what good is money in today's age but worthy experiences? I agree with you. Um, Springsteen tickets were mind-boggling, mind-bogglingly expensive. They were. Um, taking my son to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I want to go this year. My kiddos didn't want to go last year. I'm just going to go with my spouse. They can stay home. I have. I. I absolutely want to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra live. Look, money. Um, I. I. Again, it. It just doing things you love is just. It's so. It's why else make money? Why bother? I mean, you need obviously food and shelter. But when you have disposable income and have worked to have some disposable income, experiences are just such an incredible thing. All right. Let us move on. Speaking of money, um, I'm reading something from Brian. And we're not going to get into this deeply today, but I will pull up the filings for another time because we are almost an hour in and we still haven't talked about our main topic today. So... This is coming from Brian Enton over on Twitter, who's a journalist I very much trust and respect because um, Brian Enton has been covering the Gabby Petito case since the beginning. I have always found him to um, to share things with uh, integrity and sensitivity, so I appreciate that. Um, a final judgment for 
$3 million has been reached in the lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents against Brian Laundrie's estate, according to the family's attorney. Brian Laundrie did not have $3 million. It's an arbitrary number, but whatever money is received will go to the Gabby Petito Foundation, the family says. The trial, which had been scheduled for December 2022, will not be held. Note, this is separate from the lawsuit filed against the Laundrie parents, which is still moving forward. I appreciate that he made that note because I think there will be a lot of confusion about the two lawsuits because there are, in fact, two lawsuits with regard to Gabby Petito. Um, the lawsuit against the estate, I appreciate that he pointed out that that is largely symbolic because there was no money in the estate to the best of our knowledge, but any money in the estate, including any monies that Brian Laundrie might have taken out of Gabby Petito's account um, after she was killed, will go to the Gabby Petito Foundation after this settlement is sorted out. And I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that they, that not only did he update it, but he was very clear, very clear about it. Um, so with that, we, we have a settlement in one of the Gabby Petito cases. We will look back at what's going on with the lawsuit filed between the parents later. Um, I haven't had a chance to get to that. So, and I haven't gotten to the one, I haven't gotten to the one from the parents against the Moab police department. There are some, there are some interesting aspects of the law when it comes to suing government entities. So we will get into that. There are the lawsuits, um, the lawsuits moving forward against, um, between Gabby Petito's family against, uh, against Brian Laundrie's family and against the police department face some challenges, but it again is absolutely something we need to talk about because it brings quite a lot of awareness. So with that, there is that $3 million judgment, um, but it is not the end of the parent lawsuit, which is why I brought it up because I think that's important to note the difference between the two. Let's get into self-aware criminals um, this morning. Let me make sure eh, that we have all of our documents pulled up. Do I? No. Should I? Yes. Where is the article we were going to go to first? Okay. Um... I'm going to go to this article because we're not going to read every single letter that was uh, put into put into the record. Let's talk about Elizabeth Holmes real quick. Elizabeth Holmes, the former, well, the founder of now defunct Theranos, went to trial, has been convicted, is the subject of documentaries, is the subject of podcasts, of books, a book by John Carreyrou, and others. It has been a kind of stunning scandal that people have been, myself included, really invested in seeing on how it's going to end. I want to know how it's going to end. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes said that she created a blood testing machine that could go in like a Walgreens, super small. You just needed one drop of blood and, and it could test for everything. Um, what it couldn't do was any of that. So she was convicted of wire fraud, mostly for defrauding investors. Um, she was acquitted of a number of counts as well, but they found that she actively defrauded investors. The sentencing recommendations are in. We're going to go through those briefly. The government's sentencing recommendation her response to it, and then her request for sentencing. But we're going to look at this reporting coming from Insider talking about the um, the impact letters that have been submitted on her behalf, those letters in mitigation. So the government's asking for aggravation, asking for more. Elizabeth Holmes's family is asking for mitigation, asking for less. So that's what we are going to cover now once we switch screen shares. How many screen shares can we do today? A bunch, a bunch. There we go. All right. So let's take a look at this first. Elizabeth Holmes's mother, father, and brother beg a judge to give her a light sentence. And Senator Cory Brooker and even an ex-CDC chief send letters in support. Elizabeth Holmes could get decades in prison at her sentencing on Friday. Prosecutors want a 15-year sentence. Oh, oh, and $800 million in restitution. The defense, meanwhile, asks for an 18-month sentence and submitted 130 letters from friends and family seeking leniency. 
The letters come from the likes of venture capitalist Timothy Draper and Senator Cory Brooker and include revelations about Holmes's upbringing and career. Here are some highlights from them. And again, we will um, we will go through some more of this in the letters, but goodness with this. Goodness with this. Um, so let's see. Uh, my in-ears after streaming for so long yesterday are just hurting my ears. I need to find an in-ear that fits my ear better. Is it time for custom molds? No, I'm not a musician, but maybe. But maybe. But maybe. So... Holmes's partner, Billy Evans. Evans' letter to the judge was the first in the filing. I find the language in this interesting. Interesting. While Liz is incredibly hopeful, I realize she is terribly scared. Um, you live with her. This process is a string of unlikely events that lawyers, advisors, and board members all told her would never come to be. It's fine. Nobody can. Laws are pesky when you, you know, lie about what you're doing to investors to get them to invest more money, money that they lose because regulators are going to eventually come cracking down on you. The amount of people that were complicit in this is absolutely fucking stunning. But the fact that it's like, everybody just said it would be fine. It's not a whoopsie. Okay, Muffin, it's all just going to be fine. You were called the next Steve Jobs. What, what would the feds want to do bothering with you, boo-boo? They're interested in you lying. Evans countered a lot of what has been reported about Holmes's traits as CEO. He wrote, Liz has been called an incredible salesperson, that she wooed investors, partners, and employees with a sales pitch so compelling that they couldn't help but to be involved. The truth is stranger. Liz has no ability to, quote, sell something. She simply believes in things with such deep, which such, with such depth that it's alluring. She believes deeply in her life's mission. She is not a traditional natural born leader. She is more of a zealot than a showman. What? What? Her partner has said that she is more of a zealot than a showman. There were patients who got wrong results with regard to things like cancer, HIV, pregnancy, loss of pregnancy, the amount of people that could have been hurt because you just believe deeply in your own delusions is not sufficient for me. So for those of you being like, is he just saying she's a cult leader? Maybe. Maybe. That's the personality traits. He's like, she just believed her own bullshit so much it wasn't fraud. I'm surprised her defense didn't lean more into that. Lean more into that. The chat is right on. The chat is right on. You're absolutely right, Sarah adjacent. And that's what makes her dangerous. So she's a zealot. What is going to stop her from doing it again? Then she still believes in her life's purpose. Okay. But... Harm. She caused harm. Victoria said religious fervor, that's supposed to make us feel comforted. That's supposed to sway the judge to sentence her to less time. That's supposed to sway the judge. These are letters to sway the judge to sentence her to less time. That's that, that. Christine asked question. I thought this was an investment scam. It was a medical company. There was an investment scam into the technology that was for blood testing that was actively rolled out and used on clients. They were running actual blood tests with very wrong results. So it was a blood testing company. And the scam 
was getting people to invest in the machines, what she had done. And there is a fantastic um, podcast, both uh, The Dropout and Bad Blood, about this very deeply uh, that go deep into into the what happened. Um, Hulu has a dramatized version of it that touches on a lot of this. But it was... Um, it was that you could just take a drop of blood and test everything. And people who have to give blood a lot, this is great. You know, if you don't want your kids to have to give blood, I think everybody hoped that this would be real. But people in the medical field went, what you can't fucking do is that. And so she took other machines and tried to manipulate them to give blood results when her machines weren't working, which invalidated all of the procedures and how you're supposed to blood test. And when people blew the whistle on her lab directors and such, she fired them and brought in new ones. So. She's more of a zealot than a show woman. Doesn't make me want to give her less of a sentence if I'm a federal judge, by the way. She believes with religious fervor in the capacity to make the world a better place and everyone around her just wants that one truth to be possible. We end up believing the impossible alongside her. This is why she needs to go to prison, though. Because she, based on this letter from her partner, it seems to me she doesn't believe she did anything wrong. She just believed in something that wasn't possible just yet. And therefore, she did nothing wrong. Because the ends, the good at the end, wanting people to have better access to medical. And in the U.S. where our medical system is an entire rant for a separate day. Wanting to make medical treatment and care, wanting to make medical information more available to people is a noble and good end. But it just doesn't justify any means necessary that includes harming patients. The good you want to do can't just shortcut the law. And the whatever means possible is not, is not okay. Because the ends don't justify the means. If you can't make it happen, you don't get to just whoopsie doodle it with patience to continue to defraud your investors, to continue investing hundreds of millions of dollars into your company because you're telling them your technology works when it doesn't. Denny, we would love to hear this experience. I interviewed at Theranos a long time ago. It was a really weird experience. Did they make you drink green juice? Val said, as someone with a rare blood disorder, I'm speechless. I have, um, I cannot pronounce that well, but thank you. It's scary as I give blood for testing often. Yes, real harm, real harm. I have no problem with raising money to shoot for the stars and try the impossible and to try to move the world as to try to move the world forward. But you leave it in testing. You don't lie and take it out into the workforce. You don't lie and roll it out on patients to keep the funding coming in because she was lying from my perspective to keep the funding coming in. That's why she was rolling it out, trying to get enough money to make it work. If we can get it rolled out in Walgreens, we can make it work. And that's where people got so uncomfortable. Uh, people asked, what are her qualifications? Uh, she dropped out of Stanford and really wanted to make this happen. Uh, apparently, she's a zealot with religious fervor. Uh, those things have caused a lot of damage in our world. It's a rant for another day, Emily. Just let's keep going on this one. Y'all can, y'all can just, y'all can just go. Yep, yep. <sighs> Evans also shed some light on the goings on in Holmes's life during the trial. He said Holmes is in fact pregnant as one witness hinted to in an evidentiary hearing. I am not going to go on a rant 
about how and when people decide to get pregnant, what I will say is that it should not be used as a mitigating factor to her sentence because all of these charges were pending when she got pregnant with her first and her sentence was pending after conviction when she got pregnant with her second. So she is pregnant is not mitigation. <laughs> Emily's like, I literally said out loud, is that better? No. No. <sighs> Susan said, Emily, a number of talking heads, lawyer, I'm a, I mean me, um, lawyers and federal prison consultants are saying Elizabeth Holmes could be out of prison in 18 months. This can't possibly be an option, can it? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Um, question, is this a romantic partner? Yes, this is the father of her children. This is her This is her romantic partner who she lives with, uh, Billy Evans, not a business partner. Chad is bae. You guys all let me just fill it in. Um, so if you want to be famous and help the medical field, then do it like Dolly Parton. I mean, we should all do everything like Dolly Parton. Dolly's phantastic. Heather said, I've been a phlebotomist for 18 years. I know it was BS, ain't no way. I mean, and the medical community kept saying that over and over and over and over. Lawn Lumber said, you mean like having kids of your own should mitigate being sentenced for your own wrongdoing? I, she thinks being pregnant is going to mitigate it. They might, though, because this is federal white collar crime, they might allow her to be sentenced and stay out of custody until she gives birth. They might. They might. Look, there was a... I did a lot of white collar crime cases, a lot. I love them. I love paper cases. I love paper cases. Everyone can get behind the types of cases we've been covering here, like the Brooks case. Every DA in the world is going to have that same just desire to seek justice for those victims. I also felt as strongly about identity theft, paper cases, embezzlement. I love being nosy. I am a nosy bitch at heart. And digging through people's, you know, financial records gives you a whole lot of information. I very much enjoyed white collar crime as a prosecutor. So I will say that I had more than one judge say to me, but Miss Baker, this is a white collar crime. And I said, but your honor, the damage to the victims is real. And it is insurmountable sometimes, especially in the big identity theft cases. The damage is real. So these cases are also crimes. People also should be punished for them, especially when there is an ongoing pattern of this type of behavior, which with fraudy, fraudy fraudsters, there often is a pattern, a long established pattern. Um, Mama C said plenty of women give birth in prison. She's not special. She thinks she is. And she's... she. She thinks she is. She thinks she is. She spent millions on millions. Like, I think they estimated her defense cost $30 million. We'll get into it. Not everybody gets $30 million. But, Your Honor, it's a crime. Exactly. But judges don't think, um, judges don't always see white-collar crime the same. Um... Can we stop treating white collar crime as a different crime? I would, I would like to, especially when ah, don't make me, don't make me get started on the pharmaceutical companies. But when you look at some of the large pharmaceutical company cases that have come up, the damage that they do is so pervasive and far reaching. And people are like, but it's not, you know, they didn't use a gun. It's Frankie Furter, you've hit the hit the nail on the head. White collar crime feels classist. Yeah, um, it it is the languaging of it a bit, but I don't I, I don't know a better way to refer to paper cases. That's how they're referred to. Um, but we generally see these cases dealing with defendants of means, lots of means, and that the the class divide in that is is notable. We're not going to get into the different treatment of, of individuals within the within the criminal justice system today, or we will never get through today's episode. So, yes. Um, yes. And I have not done nearly as much in-depth looking at the way that um, financial crimes and other white-collar crimes are treated. So, but we will. 
So, excuse me, that was me. Sorry, I was muted. I'm not done ranting. Her partner said that Holmes swam the Golden Gate Bridge earlier this year while pregnant. Isn't it nice for her that while she is pending 30 plus years in prison, she was able to go swim the Golden Gate Bridge? Does this make her a better person than the rest of us? Like what? Good for her. How nice that she gets to go work out while she's you know, spending $30 million on her criminal defense. How nice for you. How nice for you. She swam the Golden Gate Bridge. Great. I don't give a fuck. And that her husky, Balto, was taken from their front porch by a mountain lion and killed. Danger Kitty was having none of it. I feel bad for her dog. I feel bad for her dog. What does that have to do with her sentencing? What does that have to do with her being sentenced on the crimes that she committed? What does it have to do? Also, how did that happen? <sighs> chat. Thank you, chat, for talking about the danger floof. I feel bad for the dog, but what's that have to do about her being sentenced? For all of you that said my dog stepped on a bee in the chat, it feels the same. Holmes was recently working on draft state legislation to help ensure victims of sexual violence and rape will be granted their survivors' rights and receive the care they need. Great. You can also you you can do that from anywhere. Good. Good. But that doesn't mitigate what has been done. However, if you have the ear of of members of the government who are writing letters on your behalf, I'm glad you're using it for good. But you can also do that from custody. They let you write things. I'm telling you what, if Holmes gets less time than Martha Stewart, I'm going to lose my mind. Holmes had testified during her trial because what she did was substantially more calculated. Holmes had testified during her trial that she was, I can't say the essay words on the YouTube, which offends me, but also I'm going to try to play by the YouTube rules. She was forcibly essayed in her sophomore year at Stanford, something that happens to too many on college campuses. Something that really needs to be addressed. It's getting addressed, but is a problem. But this does not excuse the crime that you did. She separately alleged that she was emotionally and sexually abused by... Uh, Sonny Balwani, her ex-boyfriend and former right-hand man at Theranos. <sighs> Evans, her, her partner, talked about how Holmes's trial had impacted their personal life. Saying they don't have privacy and have moved multiple times after their home address was revealed. I don't think people should harass them at their home. I don't ever think people should harass them at their home. But how nice to have the means to be able to move when you're getting harassed at your home. Because not everyone has that option. No one should be harassed at their home. We just... <clears throat> you know where she'd be safe, though? Well, she wouldn't be harassed at her home in prison. They might harass her in prison. But... They also say that their son has been avoided by other families not wanting to expose their children to my family. I feel for her kid. But she was pending trial when she chose to have that child. That was her choice. That was their choice as a couple. Um, so I feel for her kid. I feel for families who, who have to deal with this. 
she shouldn't put that on her kid, but that was her choice. How could you not look forward and see that this is going to affect the child that you are bringing into the world? And then she's pregnant with a second one. So has it really affected her that much? <sighs> Susanna said, this is a Karen's defense. Mm-hmm. 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 So I feel bad. I feel bad for her kid. I do. I, I feel bad. I feel bad for her kiddo. Her kid, her kid doesn't deserve that. But also, I'm not going to judge families who are like, I want nothing to do with this at all. Not, nope. The price Liz and our family pays for this process. <laughs> you mean the, the federal criminal convictions? The price Liz and our family pays for this process is not just the potential incarceration that you will decide in ways large and small. The process itself has daily costs. Yeah. This will follow us for the rest of our lives. Yeah. There is no avoiding the scorn that accompanies Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Your Honor. Your Honor, um, we are held in contempt by society. And that uh, hurts our feelings and is hard for us. So she shouldn't go to prison because our feelings are hurt and it's hard for us that there are a lot of people with a lot of contempt. When federal regulators came down on Theranos, she was asking one of her employees to lie. And instead of doing that, that employee took their own life. The cost of what she did knows no bounds. Uh, Jenna D said, you earned the scorn. Dawn said, this reeks of privilege. Mm -hmm. I feel bad for her child. I feel bad for her child too. They didn't ask for it. So this is them asking the judge to give her less time. Your Honor, this has been very hard on us. This has been very hard on us. But Your Honor, people are mean. Jen said, affluenza at its greatest. Mm -hmm. Let's go to her mother's letter. Me. Today's stream is going to be short. Also me. Fuck, we're in it now. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Emily, when flaunting how long you were on without peeing, probably don't refer to that show as a heavy stream. <laughs> in all the ways, in all the ways, in all the ways. Chad, thank you for laughing with me. And her partner, by the way, I believe they got together as these things were pending, right? Holmes's mother, Noelle Holmes. Let's see what her, her mother had to say. Noelle Holmes, who was previously a staffer on Capitol Hill, recalled the fateful moment when her daughter called say, uh, called to say she wanted to drop out of Stanford to focus on Theranos full time. I got off the phone to think about it as our child, as our children's ed education was of the utmost importance to both Chris and me. She wrote, I thought about what we want for our children to imagine, to be able to be like, I think I'll drop out of Stanford today. Imagine what that's like. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drop out of Stanford. Um, Bryn, I don't think the mom signed her name with a heart over, over the eye. Does she have a, does she have, Noelle Holmes probably doesn't have anywhere to sign a heart, but no, she didn't. Things that set me off in letters, signing with a heart, definitely, definitely, uh, set me over the edge. I thought about what we want for our children, that they would be passionate about their work and that they would do something of worth that would be good and that they could hopefully adequately provide for themselves. So we called Elizabeth back and told her we were completely behind her decision. Noelle Holmes also wrote about the first time she and her husband met Balwani, which she says was at a restaurant in 2004. On meeting us, he immediately called us mom and dad, which we found very strange. So mom's like, red flag, red flag. She said many things about him troubled us or made us uncomfortable, not the least of which was the fact that he told us 
he was in his 20s when he was obviously decades older than our 20-year-old child. Red flag, red flag, red flag. Holmes's parents found Balwani to be a very cold person and were concerned about Holmes in that relationship. We noticed that our daughter, with whom we always had a very close relationship and who we had always been so open, who had always been so open with us, became a stranger. Our conversations, uh, no more open or interesting than those you would have with your neighbor you hardly cared about, Noelle Holmes wrote. She went on to say she feels like she is living a nightmare amid her daughter's trial. What has happened to our daughter and our family is unimaginable, unimaginable to me. What Elizabeth faces going forward is devastating for us as her parents. What a price she has paid for the failure of her dreams, her own missteps, and the mistakes of experts she brought in and relied on. Right, it's their fault. Elizabeth has suffered enormously and lost everything. All her work, her company, her money that she put into starting and building the company, the stock she bought. Y'all, I can't, I can't, I can't. She lost her stock. She lost her stocks. I can't. The trauma. I just, covering this on the tail of what we covered in the Holmes, uh, not the Holmes case, in the uh, parade massacre is, is just such a stark contrast, isn't it? You guys, she lost her stocks. She's been punished enough. It's so hard for her. Fucking hell. Just fucking hell. Yeah, put the F in the chat. Put the F in the chat for the private for the private jet. Put the F in the chat for the lost stocks. Put 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 an F for all of it. The horror. Serenity now. I know. I know. Whatever will she do? Whatever will she do? The home that she's living in now has such a large estate that when that witness came to visit her, he got lost trying to get out of her estate trying to drive to her door. The estate was so big, he got lost trying to drive away from her door. Y'all, is that relatable? Because from the street to my driveway to my house is like, you know, you're, you're not going to get lost going from the street down the estate to find the house. Y'all, she might have to grocery shop for herself when she gets out of prison. What's that going to be like? Does she know that Whole Foods delivers? She probably does. All right. Elizabeth has suffered enormously and lost everything. All her work, her com... I can't even. The amount of people that lost every... <sighs> we lost a company during COVID. It fucking sucks. It sucks. How many did? How many did? Not to mention the people who lose who lose everything to medical debt. <laughs> what? <sighs> the just, the just, the just, the just. Wait, why does the size of her yard matter to the court? It doesn't. I'm just saying that her losing everything, she is still living in a home that is so massive that a witness got lost trying to get to the house from up the driveway. So the losing everything is relative, relative, relative. It's relative. We do need a sad violin. We do. We do need a sad violin. What have we got? Um, not the stocks. I do think the huge estate is her partner's. So, all right. She has suffered enormously and lost everything, all her work, her company, her money that she put into starting and building the company, the stock she bought. 
she will forever be associated with this failure. Yeah. Though it happened when she was still so young. Well, if she serves her time, there might be an opportunity for people to move on. Emily, you and a lot of the chat are so quick-witted. I'm very jealous and laugh out loud quite often. The chat is bay and they're faster than I am and I love it so much. <laughs> Noelle Holmes wrapped up by expressing hope that something good could come out of her daughter's now defunct company. Theranos's trade secrets and patents are out there in the world and someone will finish doing it and make Elizabeth's vision come true. And so her ultimate dream to do something good in the world will hopefully come to pass. Look, the thing is, everyone said the technology can't be done yet. So maybe with advancing technology, it can. But this all happened decades ago or started decades ago, and we're still not there yet. Holmes's father, Christian Holmes. Holmes's parents talked about her upbringing and aspirations as a child and shared photocopies of several handwritten letters from her childhood. Her father, who was previously a top official in the EPA under George Bush, George H.W. Bush, shared one that he said she wrote at age nine. It reads in part, what I really want out of life is to discover something new, something that mankind did not know was possible to do. But at what cost? He also described Holmes's relationship with Bawani, saying that she grew isolated from her family during that period. Always a red flag, by the way. We did not like him, Christian Holmes wrote. His personality was brash. Okay. At best, and he could get angry and demanding. Christian Holmes also framed the Theranos implosion as a shortcoming, not a crime. Muffin. This is not an oopsie doodle. Parroting a key argument the defense used at trial. She carries within her enormous sorrow for not having, for having not met the expectations of her company's patients. It didn't work. I want to know what John Carrier thinks of these letters, as well as those of her employees, friends, and investors. She yeeted anyone that questioned her. That's not not meeting expectations. That's fucking fire festival. She feels that she failed to meet the needs of people who could not afford having their blood diagnosed for whom Theranos was their only hope. She was trying to do good. Elizabeth will carry within her the profound sense of having failed to meet the needs of others the rest of her lives. That's not what this is about. Holmes's brother, also Christian Holmes. Holmes's brother is younger than her by two years. In 2011, Holmes brought him on at Theranos. In his letter to the judge, Christian recalled his sister being monofocused on academics growing up. He spoke of her being in a relationship with Bawani, because blame Bawani is the is the is the battle cry here. In the years that followed, my relationship with my sister was reduced to a series of formalities around her work. She spent all her time with Sonny and rarely included our family. I lived within driving distance from Elizabeth for about five years during this time period and worked with her for a number of years and can't remember sharing a meal with just the two of us more than a handful of times, let alone many meaningful conversations. Holmes's brother continued, while Elizabeth probably knew it was not a healthy relationship, she justified it because she felt she was learning something from him, that he was critical to the success of her business, and that she was convinced that this was the kind of personal sacrifice she needed to make in order to succeed. He attributed much of Theranos' failures to Holmes's youth and reliance on Balwani. Elizabeth is not without responsibility for the failures in her business, he wrote but I do not believe she ever set out to do anything but good. But there was still fraud. But there was still fraud. But there was still fraud. And on tape. Fraud on tape. Clouds in my coffee said, this family is still in denial. 
I think they think that it's Balwan, all Balwani's fault and it's not her fault. This entire document is a tribute to our failure as a society that blindly holds people accountable for their actions. Some actions need consequences. Yes. I'm not sure I read that properly. This entire document is a tribute to our failure as a society that blindly holds people accountable for their actions. Some actions need consequences. I agree that some actions need consequences. They do. Uh, criminal actions need criminal consequences, and all of the circumstances need to be taken into account. Um, the chat just asked, did she pledge to make the world better? Linda, I think that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Senator Cory Booker. The junior senator from New Jersey recalled meeting Holmes at a public policy conference hosted by the late Senator John McCain. Booker said that he and Holmes, both vegans, shared a small bag of almonds as there was nothing else for them to eat. She often passionately spoke of her interest in philanthropic, philanthropic causes, in meeting global challenges like climate change and world hunger, and about the grave crisis of limited access to affordable, quality health care for populations across the world and here in the United States. Okay. He wrote, I firmly believe in the possibility of rehabilitation and in the power of redemption for anyone. And I believe that Ms. Holmes has within her a sincere desire to help others to be a meaningful, to be of meaningful service and possess the capacity to redeem herself. Okay, but that doesn't mean you don't go to prison. And I don't think he's asking for that. And again, the ends don't justify the means. And I also think um, wanting to align with what people are telling you, the thing about fraudsters, they are likable and charming and you want to believe in them. And I think that's what we're seeing. She was likable and charming. And she said all the thing that value aligned with me. But she was willing to go to any length to achieve that, including fraud. That's why there's laws. <sighs> Venture capitalist Timothy Draper, Draper, who ultimately wrote Holmes a $1 million check to start Theranos, remembered Holmes coming to him at 19 seeking funding. When we backed Theranos, we knew it was going to be a long shot. Elizabeth at 19 came to us and said, we will change healthcare as we know it. When we, when the press honored her as the next wonderkind, I was thrilled for her. I probably pronounced that wrong. I pronounce it. My only knowledge of pronouncing this is from the office. I was thrilled for her, but we both knew there was still a lot of work to be done before Theranos could fully delight the customer and the beginning of the transition of healthcare could begin. Did she just start believing her own press? This is why I'm so nervous when they're like, this is the next this. And it's like six months old. It's like, it needs to be tested first. We can't just run around calling people the next Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs worked for years before he was the Steve Jobs. You don't get to work for six months and be the next Steve Jobs. Prove first. <sighs> Things take time. Draper goes on to say he wouldn't back Holmes as CEO of an organization again, but he would support her as an entrepreneur and chief science officer. That's bold. Elizabeth has a lot of brilliance in her, he wrote. She will continue to be a positive contributor to society. I hope so. Her vision for healthcare was only partially portrayed in her efforts at Theranos, and her ideas could save millions of lives over the course of the next few decades if the technology and science keeps up. Restraining her would be a travesty. Ask the victims how they feel about that. Ask the victims how they feel about that. People have asked me if I would back her again. My answer, not as CEO, but as an entrepreneur and chief science officer, absolutely. Bold. That's bold. Um, Tenton Capital Chairman and CEO David Skoll. Skull questioned whether the jury knew enough about the business to reach an appropriate verdict. Why does this feel like a, you wouldn't understand. It's business. It's above you. It's above you. 
I'm already mad. This is why we do first looks. So we just get all of the Emily reactions. Um, all of them. Uh, just as Miss Holmes's decisions were not flawless, neither is the jury system flawless. No, humans are flawed. I accept the jury's decision in Ms. Holmes's trial. However, I also believe that such a trial revolves around extremely complex business realities, which would be complicated for an experienced business person, let alone someone not trained in such things as event such things as venture capital investing. Oh, I'm sorry. You all don't understand venture capital. How dare you, people of the jury, deign to seek judgment on venture capital. You just don't understand what it's like to move around billions of dollars to change the world for you. You should all be thankful, not convicting people. How dare you? How dare you? Look, it's the jury's job to help them understand. Lori, a dumb jury of randos. Yep. Yep. I'm sick of people thinking that because they are wealthy, they are better than or smarter than or harder working than or more deserving than. You might have more access than. Fair. But it doesn't mean that you are smarter than, better than, or more uh, capable how dare you deign to understand? But what do I know? I'm just a neurodivergent lawyer who was told she didn't understand her whole life. So pardon my rage. I'm sorry, this might be too complex for you. It's not. It's not. It's pretty simple. Um, this is a pretty simple case. This is what the jury decided. She told the investors A, B, and C. A, B, and C were false. Ergo wire fraud. That's not complex. That's not complex. That's lies. You know who understands lying? Everyone. We need to go back to the victim that spoke two days ago who said, these are things you learn in kindergarten. It's not nuanced or complex. It's not about venture capital. Did you lie to get the money? Yes, done, great, great. Um, the chat's like, this is insufferable. It is, it is, it is. Let's keep going. The, the, I'm very I'm very tired of the elitism of we know better than you. You fucking don't though. Sorry. I also believe that such a trial revolves around extremely complex business realities. The the AUSA has brought in experts, but okay. Which would be complicated for an experienced business person, let alone someone not trained in such things as venture capital investing, accounting pro forma projections and related legal concepts and laws. As a knowledgeable investor, I can say with certainty that I would not have found Ms. Holmes guilty on any of the wire fraud charges. Is it because you rec like, like recognizes like? Is that why? The elite explaining, that's exactly what it is. Please elite explain this to me better. <laughs> oh goodness oh goodness oh goodness i would not have found miss holmes guilty on any of the wire fraud charges sir you weren't on the jury skull said he knew holmes to be kind smart and a positive contributor to our society later in his letter skull invoked Thomas Edison's name to make his case for leniency. <sighs> Thomas Edison would like to be excluded from this narrative. So would Jesus, God, Maya Angelou, Beyonce, and anyone else whose name might be invoked. Failure, while unfortunate, is understood and recognized as part of the creative process, he wrote. Thomas Edison failed over a thousand times by his own estimate. He was not a criminal. Neither is Miss Holmes. I'm going to barf. This 
is not failure. If she had failed her investors and said, guess we can't get it to market, that's different. They ran the risk and they lost. She took it to market when it didn't work, told people that it did, lied to patients, lied to investors. You are missing the point. This isn't about it not working. It's about lying that it wasn't working. <sighs> Edgar Allan Poe would also like to be excluded. Uh, <sighs> so Edison stole the IP from Tesla. I mean... <laughs> Uh, Tannis Edison was a fraud who stole a lot of his patents. I mean, there we go. Uh, so who wrote this? Oh, we'll go back. This is um, the chairman of Teton Capital, David School. Okay. School was CEO of Berkshire Hathaway's energy subdivision when he bought $10 million worth of shares in chemical company, Lubrizol Corp. I, I can't say that with a straight face. Days before he encouraged Warren Buffett to buy the firm. Berkshire said his vi Berkshire said he violated its insider trading policy and he resigned in 2011. Oh, insider. That's a helpful note. That dude's been accused of insider training to the point where he had to resign from Berkshire Hathaway. And is like <laughs> so when I said like recognizes like, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> you all wouldn't understand why it's not fraud. <laughs> tell that to tell that to Martha Stewart, who went to prison for it. Tell tell that to her. Shock. Former CDC director William Fogue. Fogue led the CDC from 1977 to 1983 and is credited with devising the global strategy that helped eradicate smallpox. In his, letter, he, in his letter, recalled meeting Holmes in March 2014 at the request of Senator Sam Nunn to, quote, get a briefing on what Theranos was doing. I was impressed by her scientific knowledge, her desire to solve big health problems, her enthusiasm, and her work ethic of long hours in search for improved tools in blood testing. <clears throat> she designed studies to test every step of the process of collecting, sorting, testing blood samples. In my view, watching Ms. Holmes, she was 100% committed to the company. No one doubts her commitment. She was so committed that she was willing to commit a crime to make it keep going forward. That She was absolutely committed. Holmes has often been touted as a charismatic communicator for her ability as a then 20-something to conceive, to convince much older, high-profile figures, mostly men, to become investors and board members, though they knew little about their nose. Folks spoke to her influence over those people. She had a unique ability was it a religious fervor? She had a unique ability to involve former cabinet members, senators, and people accustomed to being in charge. But they listened to her. Part of this was her knowledge of the subject, but part was also her eagerness to absorb ideas and change tactics based on what she was hearing. Fogue also recalled meeting with Holmes after Theranos crumbled. Her questions revolved around what else she could do that would benefit society. She was not trying to revive Theranos, but was looking for alternative ways of contributing to the world. Former Theranos employees. Several former employees also submitted letters in support of Holmes. One former uh, machinist wrote, she was hard. She is a hardworking woman and nothing but kind to her employees. I believe in her character. Another came from former uh, security supervisor for Arizona operations. Despite her current situation, I still believe Elizabeth Holmes to be an honorable individual a valuable member of the community, and a good human being. Theranos was the best company I've ever worked for throughout my professional career. Our leadership under Elizabeth was second to none. One former senior scientist remarked in his own letter that Holmes seemed to work on a 24-7 schedule. Can we stop holding this up as like a paragon of virtue? Having no boundaries and working yourself to death is not noble. It's out of balance. This is not, they worked nonstop. It's not noble. Uh, 
Holmes seemed to work on a 24 seven schedule, but that her inexperience couldn't be overcome. This person wrote her first real job was a startup CEO. She didn't work in high school. Oh, right. She didn't work in high school. Somebody should have had her work in food service. It's fucking hard. She would have learned about meeting costs. This person wrote her first real job was a startup CEO. Any of you have your first work experience as a startup CEO? One of my first jobs, I was a lifeguard where they also made the lifeguards clean the bathrooms at the end of the day. Wet, sandy bathrooms have a very specific smell. Her first real job was startup CEO. She had to rely on other managers to oversee the daily operations. Some of the managers were not from the biotech industry. Their understanding of the development process, maybe that was by design. Their understanding of the development process and timeline might not really make too much sense. They often forced deadlines and Elizabeth was sold easily all the time and overly optimistic about the development process. There were so many problems that were overlooked. Whose fault is that if not the CEO? It was a systematic management problem or a systemic management problem due to her inexperience. That is why I was not surprised many years later when I heard that things went wrong with Theranos. I don't know if that's a glowing recommendation. Let's see what the government has to say. I love you guys sharing your first jobs. Please share your first jobs. Please, please. My first job was kitchen prep, then McDonald's, then Home Depot. All were rough for different reasons. I've worked some rough jobs. We'll have to talk about first jobs um, at some point. None of it was the, none of it was this. There's a difference, I think. Um, and I'm I'm blessed to also be in this category. I knew that if things went horribly wrong, there would be some help from my parents. Many, many do not have any safety net at all. The job has to work because they have to support themselves. If she had not succeeded at Theranos, she would have had somewhere to land and 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 try again. So I love seeing all your first jobs. Let's go see what the government has to say about Elizabeth Holmes and their sentencing memo. We're going to run a little bit late. Um, I'm just going to check my calendar. I have an interview this afternoon for next week's podcast interview for next week's podcast. Uh, but I got a little bit of time. So I've got a little bit of time. Um, I love how many of you worked at Subaway. God, I fucking love Subaway. I love Subway. My kids were not, my oldest was a fan of Subway. My youngest was not a fan of Subway until the odd ones out. He found James's videos in the odd ones out. And James's video about Kim working at Subaway were so compelling that my youngest was like, I want to go to Subaway. And it just made my life so easy. I, there was a, um, there was a homicide trial. I ate Subway every single day for lunch. And at the end of the trial, the, uh, head counsel on the case, I, I dealt with all the tech stuff. Shockingly, the head counsel on the case <laughs> gave me a Subway gift card. And she's like, you seem to like Subway. I'm like, it doesn't hurt my stomach. It doesn't make me fall asleep. I know exactly what I'm getting. And I just need to eat lunch quickly. Subway checks all of the fucking boxes. This is what I'm eating every single day for lunch. And um, it was just too funny. She's like, girl, you really do eat a lot of Subway. I'm like, I don't have time to make lunch. Subway, also the Subway was right next to Starbucks. So I went and got us breakfast at Starbucks, got Subway, got in my car and drove us to court. It worked well. <laughs> uh, there was no groceries at my house at the time. I was in, it was in trial. Um, all right. We're going to go to the government's memo first. It's 46 pages. We're not going to, we're going to jump around like has a pain in this. All right. I should swoop. Government sentencing memorandum. Re Elizabeth Holmes. United States sentencing memorandum. Let's see. Uh table of authorities introduction facts. The offense uh, the offense conduct or the offensive conduct depending on how you want to say it. The offense conduct, the investor fraud, the impact on patients, the cover up Procedural history, sentencing guidelines, and calculation lost more than $550 million. Offense involving 10 or more victims. These are these are aggregating calculations. Offense involving consciousness of reckless risk or death or serious bodily injury. Like, we didn't give a fuck about the patients. Role in the offense. Like, how how far up the chain were you? So these are all these are all factors that go towards the judge sentencing her to more time. Argument, legal standard, government recommendation, nature and circumstances of the crimes, history and characters of Holmes, 
um, the need to reflect on the seriousness of the offense, um, promote respect for law, and provide just punishment for the offense, the need to afford adequate deterrence to criminal conduct. It seems like she's not accepted that this is criminal. It's like business, business, business. Business, business, business. Y'all just don't understand that it's businessy, business, business things. Because how could you? I understand that it's just businessy, business things and not fraud. Uh, the need to protect the public from future crimes by homes, the properly calculated sentencing guideline range, and uh, pertinent policy statements provided by the Sentencing Commission, the need to avoid unwarranted disparities, the need to provide restitution to any victim, and then the restitution and fine, and then the conclusion. So we're gonna we're going to go through the facts and stuff, and then um, what they're recommending, which is a lot. Over the course of many years, Elizabeth Holmes defrauded dozens of investors and hundreds of million of hundreds of millions of dollars. Time and time again, she chose deceit over candor. It's a great sentence. Go AUSAs. We appreciate that's a great, it really puts a point on it, uh, doesn't it? She forged her own endorsements. That's facts. The lying didn't just go to to all of it. She did forge documents. That was uh, that was presented at trial. She preyed on hopes of her investors that a young, dynamic entrepreneur could change healthcare, because people want healthcare to be better. People want healthcare to be better all the way around. She leveraged the credibility of her illustrious board, and then through her deceit, she attained spectacular fame, adorations, and billions of dollars of wealth. And people conflate wealth and fame with value. When a journalist dared to ask questions about Theranos' actual achievements, she tried to dupe him and then attacked him along with his sources. That's John Carreyrou. If you want to know more about it, it is in his podcast and book, Bad Blood. It's in all of his writing. It took a journalist with tremendous fortitude and integrity to break this story. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of this story is that it took a journalist doing, you know, journalism work, asking questions hard questions, finding sources, and being unwavering in the work that they were doing that really toppled this after so many other journalists just lauded her as, as the next Steve Jobs. I really, I, I appreciate that. And we don't see it enough. Truly, we don't see it enough because fear. After her fraud was revealed, she lied, obviously, never, I'm never covered up. <laughs> and concealed. At trial, she blamed her COO and longtime boyfriend, as her family did, her board, her scientists, her business partners, her investors, her marketing firm, her attorneys, the media, everyone, that is, but herself. Snaps for some sassy government writing. She also put patients at risk. Mm -hmm. As money was drying up, she went to market with an unproven and unreliable medical device, when her lead assay developer quit as Theranos launched, she chillingly told the scientist she has a promise to deliver to the customer. She doesn't have much of a choice but to go ahead with the launch trial transcript. As her lab director kept uh, encountering issues with Theranos' devices and tests, she chose PR and fundraising over patient care. During her fraud scheme, women received wrong tests about their pregnancies, Theranos generated wrong results for cancer tests, and one victim was led to believe that she had the virus that causes AIDS. Even after Theranos itself concluded that there was a possible patient impact for every single test run for patients on its quote-unquote Edison device and voided all Edison tests, Holmes minimized its primary regulator's finding of immediate jeopardy to the patients. Immediate jeopardy and condition level deficiencies as not quote unquote major. Y'all, it's just a little inconvenience. Holmes speaks eloquently about her desire to innovate and improve healthcare. A noble goal does not justify risk to people. She has demonstrated a strong work ethic, charisma, and ambition. Most that are involved in fraud. She's blinded by that ambition, almost like a, uh, a zealot, perhaps, which, you know, words from her boyfriend. 
her reality distortion field put and will continue to put people in harm's way. Maybe the court will read her psychological evaluation. Wouldn't we love to see it? Her reality distortion field put and will continue to put people in harm's way. She stands before the court remorseless. She accepts no responsibility. Quite the opposite. She insists she is the victim. Alex, I'll take criminals that lack self-awareness for 500 or 800 million. She is not. Holmes was the CEO and chairperson of Theranos. She repeatedly chose lies, hype, and the prospect of billions of dollars over patient safety and fair dealing with investors. Elizabeth Holmes's crimes were not failing. They were lying. Lying in the most serious context where everyone needed her to tell the truth. The sentencing guidelines appropriately recognize that Holmes's crimes were extraordinarily serious among the most substantial white collar offenses Silicon Valley or any other district has seen. According to the pre-sentence investigation report, the PSR, they yielded a recommendation, a recommended custodial sentence beyond the statutory maximum. That's rare. Oh. The PSR recommended custodial sentence beyond the statutory maximum. PSRs are normally quite low, in, uh, in, particularly in fraud crimes where there's no physical injury. Um, that, that's rare. That sounds like a, that's a, that's a lot. Hmm. It, PSRs run low. PSRs didn't recommend Josh Duggar for more than maximum. Let's remember. Hmm. I'm surprised by that. This is why we do first looks. I'm actually really, really surprised by that. Lawn Lumber says, hint, hint, judge, you're safe to sentence the max. Hint, hint, we believe you should sentence the max. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Ooh. The factors set forth within 18 U.S.C. 3553, notably the nature and circumstances of the offense, the need for the sentence to reflect the seriousness of the offense and promote a respect for the law, the need for both specific deterrence and general deterrence, demand significant custodial sentence. With these factors in mind, the government respectfully remands a sentence of 180 months in custody. I believe that's about 18 years. Uh, the court should also order Holmes to serve a three-year term of supervised release, parole, pay full restitution to her investors, including Walgreens and Safeway, and pay the required special assessment for each count. That's going to be significant amounts of money because it's hundreds of thousands of dollars for each count. Facts, the offense uh, conduct, the investor fraud, through numerous misrepresentations and half-truths, Holmes sold investors on the fact that Theranos had a customer-ready device proven through its use and validated by several large pharmaceutical companies. That was the forgeries, the Department of Defense, that was a lie, and Walgreens that analyzed tiny drops of blood taken from the finger to produce better, faster, cheaper, and more accurate laboratory test results. Don't we all wish that that was real? We do. Specifically, Holmes secured dozens of investors in Theranos over several years by falsely claiming that Theranos had manufactured one single proprietary blood analyzer device that could run any blood test that was run by conventional labs all from a blood sample drawn via a finger stick rather than the traditional draw from a vein with higher accuracy and less variability than traditional methods. Everyone wants that to be true. Due in part to its more, it's just not, due in part to its more automated process that reduced human error inherent in running tests in a laboratory to support her bold claims. Lies? Holmes repeatedly told potential investors that Theranos' technology had been comprehensively validated by multiple major pharmaceutical companies and was being used in the battlefield by the Department of Defense to treat wounded soldiers. All the military families, you can just, just, get, just all of you get offended all at once. Just, I feel, I feel the offense. Holmes also asserted that Theranos was a profitable company and had a healthy ongoing relationship with retail pharmacy company Walgreens, through which it provided blood tests to patients beginning in September 2013. Not only did several representatives 
of investors testified that Holmes made these statements to them in meetings. Holmes also begun providing written materials and binders, binders full of fraud, to investors in 2014 and 15 that contained these false statements. Binders full of fraud. In truth, scientists who worked at Theranos testified that Theranos's proprietary device could never complete more than 12 types of blood tests, often with less accuracy, less automation, and more variability than the traditional predicate machines manufactured by third-party companies such as Siemens. Because of these shortcomings, pharmaceutical companies did very little work with Theranos and did not validate its technology, and the Department of Defense never used Theranos as analyzer to clinically treat soldiers. Yeah, because they don't want to get fucking sued. Theranos had zero revenue in 2012 and 2013 and desperately needed new sources of cash. Holmes hid the shortcomings of Theranos's proprietary device by using, without telling potential investors, modified and unmodified third-party machi machines to fulfill the remainder of Theranos's available blood test menu to patients at Walgreens stores. As a result, Theranos's relationship with Walgreens was faltering because the percentage of traditional venous draws was too high. Yes, if you tell them you don't have to do any of that, and then you have to, it's a problem. But none of this information was shared with the investors. Um, as but a few examples of misrepresentation made by Holmes to Theranos investors in April 2010, Holmes emailed executives of Walgreens reports with favorable conclusions about Theranos' technology that were emblazoned with logos of large pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, others, now Merrick, and Holmes described the attached reports as three independent due diligence reports on the Theranos system that were from these companies. However, at trial, Holmes admitted that she added the logos of the pharmaceutical companies to reports written by Theranos and enhanced the conclusions. Enhanced. Well, you see, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I just, I just enhanced the conclusions. It's not, it's not lying. I enhanced the conclusions not a lie. Yes, neither is the weight on my driver's license. Totally false. <laughs> I just enhanced the conclusions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I played water polo in college, you know what conclusion I enhanced? My height. I am not, in fact, 5'8". The lies. The lies. <laughs> the lies. I didn't lie. I just, chat, go right ahead. I didn't lie. I just added 50% to the total. <laughs> it wasn't forgery. It was enhancement. That doesn't work in science. Yes. I just enhanced my height, my wealth. Look, if you want to make it look like it's enhanced, just get a manscaped. I've got a code. And uh, trim the hedges and it will look enhanced. And then it's not a lie. <laughs> she fluffed the conclusions. Can I enhance my bank balance? I enhanced my white hair with dye. She absolutely fluffed the conclusions. She pled the conclusions. <laughs> 5A was enhanced for me. <laughs> I'm not 5'8". Um, yes, it was funny because my brother, so my brother played water polo at UCLA. And um, it was funny looking at the the statistics of the teams and looking at the height and then looking at them in person and being like, look, I don't have a great perception, but I'm pretty sure that you are not in fact six foot seven. I'm pretty sure you're somewhere in like the six foot four range. I think I can tell that difference. Y'all are still very tall. It was funny. Um, yeah, it's like my driver's license saying I'm five five. <laughs> I love that you guys are using the the uh, Pinocchio emoji. She did the NCIS criminal tech magic zoom enhance. Yes, it was like <laughs> pinch and zoom, pinch and zoom. It totally works. She pledged the conclusions. Yes, she pledged that it would work. She pledged that it would work. <laughs> Just ask 50 Cent about the enhancement. Don't. He'll sue all of us for defamation. 50 Cent has defended the honor of his dick in legal filings. We will not besmirch it in the chat. <laughs> Did she pledge to or donate those conclusions? She pledged them. Um, yes, I think the court, I think they're asking the court to um, enhance the sentence. I think that's exactly what's being what's being asked is to enhance the second, enhance the sentence. 
we might need enhanced conclusions mugs. <laughs> That's funny as hell. Snaps to the government for actually being funny. <laughs> I appreciate a witty following, a witty filing. Thank you to the AUSAs who brought us some joy today. Um, reports written by Theranos and enhanced the conclusion shortly before sending to Walgreens. Actually, I guess that's from Elizabeth Holmes's own testimony. It's funny how she even spun it when she was testifying. I didn't lie. I just enhanced the conclusions in science. Science. It's science. And while a Pfizer representative testified at trial, he told Holmes directly that Pfizer did not see a use for Theranos technology in 2009. Holmes continued to send the doctored Pfizer report to investors throughout 2014 and 2015. Pfizer's like, look, man, we do a lot of shit, but we didn't do this. This ain't us. Don't, don't include us in the narrative. Pfizer would also like to be excluded from the narrative. She claimed alternative facts. Yes, she did. Yes, yes, she did. Yes, she did. Um, Sandy, question, no one back, no one back tested her devices. Um, she lied about them because they tested it and said that they didn't need it. So... She lied that they were in fact tested when they were not. Yes, it's insane. It's 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 wild. In 2010, Holmes told Steve Bird, then CEO of Safeway, that Theranos was cash flow neutral and had projected revenue for 2011 of two point or sorry, 223 million. When in truth, Theranos's revenue was steadily declining from approximately 2.8 million in 2009 to less than 600,000 in 2011. But somehow we're going to go from 600,000 to 223 million. It's just, it's just all going to work out. <laughs> what, you can't, what you can't do, what you can't do, what you can't do. Despite Theranos earning zero revenue in 2012 and 2013, Holmes and COO Sonny Bawani provided investors with projections that Theranos would earn $140 million in revenue for 2014. What, were they just doing magic math? Like, what the fuck is happening? It's like, ah, uh, numbers. This goes back to the dude who wrote the letter. <clears throat> you just don't understand the complexities of venture capital because your randos see that's how venture capital works like one year you have zero in revenue and one year you have zero in revenue and then poof 140 million dollars in revenue it's just it just makes sense it's just math that you don't understand because it's venture capital if you just use the right magic words money <laughs> okay Theranos would earn $140 million in revenue in 2014 and nearly $1 billion in 2015. They're projections. They're projections. Okay, Muffin. A hundred or a billion. A billion in revenue. A billion. A billion. Yes, she was just enhancing the outcome of her bank account. Somebody said inverted capital, <laughs> invented capital. Yes, it might have been invented capital. It's like lawyer math. It's worse than lawyer math. <laughs> she should have gone on Shark Tank, maybe. Everybody in the chat's like, why can't I math like that? Yes, let's do it. Oh my God, I love you mansplaining in this voice. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Holmes told one investor in December 2013 that Theranos had historically earned over $200 million from its work with the Department of Defense. No, she did not. Like, the DOD is totally on board. We have like $200 million in government contracts. Yay! <sighs> oh, the DOD and pharmaceutical companies. When in reality, Theranos never earned more than $10 million from both sources combined. What's the most shocking about this is that the government didn't just pour fucking money into it. I'm more shocked that the government didn't give her $200 million at this point. Truly. I'm truly more surprised about that. Good goodness. Um, Christy's like, Christy said, like, we're totally BFFs with the DOD. Yes. And for an investor, here's the thing. For an investor, I, um, for an investor, 
knowing that there are government contracts coming in would be like, oh, we're going to be cash flow positive because the government spends money like it's fucking water in a 40 ounce Stanley. It's just like, it's nothing. We've got all. I mean, what was Fat Leonard doing? I know. Fat Leonard got a lot more out of the government than Elizabeth Holmes did. So when is the actual sentencing? Tomorrow. That's why we're covering this today. Oh, man. Is donated the enhanced version of pledged? I mean, she she said that the DOD pledged her $200 million. No, she didn't. She said she had earned it. Earned. Maybe she uses it synonymously with like earned and would like to earn. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just synonymous. I earned with uh, project. Same, same. Uh, so she told investors that Theranos had earned over $200 million from its work with the DOD and pharmaceutical companies. That was $10 million, not $200 million. You know, this is a little difference. In August and September 2013, initial internal Theranos scientists, including longtime employee um, Sarika uh, Gankluk, Gankahar, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I do, I do terribly with last names. Um, and lab director, Dr. Adam Rosendorf. Rosendorf is the one that went to her home, as you will recall, warned homes that Theranos' proprietary device was not able to reliably test patient samples. They told her. So when her family's like, somebody said it's Girardi math, it's absolutely Girardi math. Absolutely. Earnings are synonymous with aspirations. Yes. Um... They told her, they told her. So when her family's writing letters saying everyone let her down, they told her she didn't care and then lied. It wasn't the lab director's fault. They told her things she didn't want to hear and then she yeeted them. They both testified that Holmes pressured and rushed the scientists to quickly validate assays for clinical use in advance of the launch with Walgreens. Um, the scientists, including Sarika, ultimately resigned shortly before the Walgreens launch because of concerns with the reliability of running patient tests on Theranos proprietary devices. Yeah, with integrity. They're like, fine, if you're not going to listen, we're out. But when... She informed Holmes of her concerns. Holmes responded that she had made a promise to deliver to the, cust to the customer that she must fulfill. It's not sweatshirts. <sighs> Despite these internal concerns being voiced repeatedly to Holmes, Holmes reviewed and approved an article in the Wall Street Journal. Uh-oh. I had forgotten it was the Wall Street Journal that said everything was okay. Holmes reviewed and approved an article in the Wall Street Journal claiming Theranos devices could run a thousand laboratory tests with more accuracy than conventional method. Holmes shared the article with investors. Mm -hmm. Just because you have the Wall Street Journal lie for you doesn't mean it's not lying. In 2013 and 2014, Holmes repeatedly told investors that the DOD was using Theranos um, on medvac helicopters in the battlefield or to treat soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. In truth, the DOD never used Theranos' devices to clinically treat patients, nor did it ever move out of initial testing phases. One investor victim impact statement captures the depravity of Holmes's lies in this respect as follows, quote, I feel strongly that the sentencing should take into account defendants' intentional decision to prey upon investors' uh, reference for our investors reverence for our service men and service women in the armed forces our country's freedom is protected every day by the courageous and selfless selfless service of those men and women and the defendant took advantage of investors patriotic feelings for selfish gain through deceit indeed elizabeth holmes lied to me about saving soldiers lives through military contracts and theranos's use of proprietary technology on military helicopters Simply put, Holmes's actions were loathsome and un-American. And that is the victim impact statement of Craig Hall, dated September 6, 2022. In August 2014, Balwani forwarded Holmes an email from Walgreens executives expressing a desire to reduce Venus draws below 10%, whereas they had been hovering around 40% for the year before expanding further. 
Nevertheless, Holmes presented financial projections at least one investor in October 2014 that projected Theranos would increase from being in a few dozen Walgreens store to being in 900 by 2015. That's just like made up, made up numbers. All right, let's get into, um, let's get into the sentencing recommendation. Holmes exploited, okay, after this paragraph, Holmes exploited investors' altruistic motives to dupe investors of all experience levels to invest in Theranos. Holmes fooled investors who were new to the healthcare investment sphere, as well as investors with deep sophistication and experience in healthcare and biotech. Um, Mr. Grossman testified that he sent lengthy due diligence questions to Holmes and Balwani to ensure there was no ambiguity about the limitations of Theranos's proprietary technology, and yet was shocked to learn more than 18 months after his investment that Theranos used third-party commercial machines and not exclusively Theranos proprietary devices, right, because they lied. Former Secretary of State George Schultz invested in Theranos on behalf of his family members and, as his son and daughter-in-law described in their victim impact statement, Holmes succeeded by using my father and others and played him for a fool. Holmes often seized on investors' desires to make the world a better place in order to lure them into believing her lies. So for all of you that were like, is this a cult? You just can run that through yourself. Just if you look at the descriptions, she, people were pulled in by the fervor and the desire to do something good. For example, Lisa Prest, uh, Peterson, a representative of investor RDV Corporation, was moved by Holmes's pitch because she could envision the benefits Holmes promised Theranos could deliver on her husband's health condition. Holmes and Bawani knew this and even sent text messages to each other, such as, quote, they also care about our mission to do good because they are a religious org. To which Holmes responds, good. Oh, look, finding someone's weakness and using it to exploit them. Weird. When Holmes was publicly touting Theranos as a revolution in healthcare, she and Balwani quietly and repeatedly acknowledged the dark reality within Theranos to each other. For example, they texted as follows. Ooh, text messages in a chart. I love a chart. I love a chart. I love a chart. Elizabeth Holmes, we have to work together on this rev piece. Sonny Balwani, you are the company. We need revenue. Sonny Balwani, Pissing me off, we don't have anyone managing PSC, um, CNT production, CART production, um, Elisa essays, Elizabeth Holmes, I know. Sunny Bawani, need to focus on ops, lab customer service, uh, all need director level people. We need the lab and call center fixed, rebuild. Holmes, fundamentally, we need to stop fighting fires by not creating them. Need to fix the root cause here, yes. Sunny Bawani, we can't scale with WAG, which is Walgreens. Um, study by Wanity. Norm Normand Lab is a fucking disaster zone. Yeah, they named the lab Normandy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They named the machine Einstein. They named the lab Normandy. Sunny by Wani. Uh, the point about to, the point about narrowing down menu to hit high FS percent came to me like a gift from God. Oh, let's maybe only focus on the shit we can do. Weird. Weird. We must hit our volume goals now. We need to make it matter. We need to make it a matter of life and death. It is a matter of life and death for the patients. Survival. We must not lose. SB, I'm worried about our overexposure without solid substance, which is lacking right now. We can talk tomorrow about overexposure. Agree. That's them in 2015 talking about her becoming too famous. SB, it is most maddening. There is no focus in any chem team's and no product coming out. Holmes, I know. I know her whole family wants to blame Sonny Balwani, but it sounds like he is trying to raise the red flag. He's convicted as well. His sentencing won't be till December. He's convicted as well. But it sounds like he was not pushing her along, that he was also internally raising the red flag. That's what it sounds from these text messages. SB, we need our head downs and execute. Bring billion equity and billion revenue. I know, thinking same. 
as B, we need a better strategy for Norma D. For a long time to come, we will have hybrid solutions. That's talking about not being able to run tests on Edison. This is in 2015. EH, I agree. SB, we need to focus on being a technology company. We spend all our time with CLIA morons. Homes, yes. Balwani, I deal with CLIA every day, and I hate the low quality of people in lab. Elizabeth Holmes, I was thinking the exact same. <clears throat> tell me you're an elitist without telling me you're an elitist. The low quality of people in the lab. Wow. Her response is, I was thinking the exact same. SB, we need to commit to each other and get out of this hell so we can live in paradise, in paradise we both have. Holmes, I was li I've literally been meditating on the exact same. Whole time I was running, I was thinking that. SB, we need to commit to focusing and getting in paradise. EH, product company, winning. Jen D says, dear people, stop texting your crimes. Love me. No, don't. We'll never catch them. <laughs> they will never be caught. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for putting the definition of CLIA, Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. It's a federal program. So thank you. It does the approval for labs. Here's Bex in the chat. Does the approval for labs so they verify certain tests are safe. You know, it's the oversight. The oversight. The regulatory body that governs lab. It's the oversights. They basically call us all peasants. Yes, we don't know anything. And they don't want to deal with the oversight committees, which is why they didn't want to deal with oversight because they weren't going to ever make it. They weren't going to be, they weren't going to be um, certified. I don't think that's the right word, but certified to be able to do these tests. And that's why they went to a direct to consumer in Walgreens, because if they went direct to consumer, they could circumvent some of the oversight and they chose that path to circumvent oversight. Randomizer said CLIA are the people preventing you from frauding, right? Which is why they tried to end route it and did successfully end route it. That's always a red flag. Yup. Um, Law and Lumber, the similarities between this and FTX is pretty amazing. Yep. 9-22-2015, Balwani. Our validation reports are terrible. Really painful going through this process. What, being bad at what you do? Some issues FDA pointed out. Going bad so far, pray. Daniel has nothing ready. Praying. Your thoughts and prayers aren't going to get you there. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The government goes on to continue to, uh, to lamp blast. We're only on page 13 of this. If you want me to read more of it, I will. I want to get to their recommendations because we have been live for two and a half hours because I've been ranting and talking about cups because I needed a little time. The cover-up. In 2015, Holmes learned that a Wall Street Journal reporter was working on a negative story about Theranos. Look, it's not all bad. There are good reporters. WSJ guy might show up tomorrow. She and Balwani scrambled to have the Phoenix store prepared to perform only finger stick tests rather than vein draws, hoping to avoid the possible impression Theranos was doing ordinary blood testing. Sonny Balwani, we need tomorrow to test and then team can push production tomorrow night. So Wednesday, it will trigger FS for GL18 general chemistry. So if he comes, it may be three FS. These are their texts. The government is using their words against them. It is always my favorite strategy. Ultimately, Balwani told Holmes, the team is not confident about pushing out finger stick tonight. We don't want to rush this. We went through hell. Unable to dupe the reporter, they then hired David Boyce, attorney, to try to get him to drop the story. When things weren't going well at Theranos, they hired a lawyer to just start intimidating people. When that failed, Holmes personally appealed to the owner of the Wall Street Journal, who was also a significant investor at Theranos, 
to quash the story. Hmm. How very elitist. Can you imagine? I know the owner. Let me just call the owner. They invested in our company. Let me just, the lawyer intimidation didn't work. The integrity of John K. Rue cannot be understated. Holmes also attacked those she believed to be the reporter's sources. See the victim impact statements. In June 2015, she had a man sit all day outside of Erica Chung's new workplace to serve a letter from boys, Schiller, etc., threatening her with legal action. SB, I'm okay sending a letter to Erica, as in general counsel, Heather King's email. After the reporter published a negative story, Holmes tried to dismiss um, Erica Chung as a low-level disgruntled employee. She also had Boyce Schiller lawyers surprise Taylor Schultz and his grand at his grandfather George Schultz's house to have him sign an affidavit identifying himself as a source for the reporter. Elizabeth Holmes, quote, if Tyler thinking about George FYI at the right time. Sonny Bawani, you not calling George back also sends a message that we are about to suit. I assume they mean sue. The incident enraged George Schultz which he described as one of the worst little things he had seen anyone try to do. And he's in politics. George wants to know what Tyler has done. Would you ask David if I should say or tell him we'll let him know later and text me back? During this time period, Holmes and Bawani also discussed nailing this motherfucker in CLIA, who they believed to be spreading negative information and at various times contemplated action against Taylor Schultz, Erica Chung, Adam Rosendorf. Hopefully Adam Rosendorf reads this and knows that they were going to literally try to sue the living fuck out of you. So stop feeling bad about testifying. And Rochelle Gibbons, the wife of a Theranos scientist, who took his own life in 2013 because she was asking him to lie. When the negative Wall Street Journal story broke, Holmes lied and disassembled. On October 15th, 2015, when confronted on Jim Cramer's mad money with the journal's claim that Edison could only do 15 out of the 240 test, not the thousand, not the thousand that they had told uh, the, uh, the other publication, Holmes falsely stated, every test that we offer in our laboratory can run on our proprietary devices. At that time, Theranos was not using Edison or any future iteration of its device for any tests and had never used Edison for more than 12. On October 21st, 2015, she falsely stated at a public conference that Theranos, quote, never used commercially available lab equipment for finger stick based tests. That's just a lie because they did. I like that the government included the video. The comment so concerned Balwani that he texted, worried about your all finger sticks on our technology comment. I know her family wants to blame Balwani, but he's like, um, hey, so look, as the CEO of a company, what you can't do is just um lie. Lie. Is that legal? No. That's why we're here. It's not legal. She's like, but I'm doing good. Months later, Holmes continued to withhold information from RDV and other investors, which made it impossible to make informed decision about the status and value of our investment. See the victim impact statement. Holmes's cover-up lasted. Uh, Holmes's cover-up had lasting and devastating effects. According to one victim impact statement, Holmes intentionally lied to George Schultz about Tyler to discredit him to prevent Schultz from learning the truth, creating a permanent rift within the family. Uh, the victim impact statement describing how Holmes took a wrecking ball to the Schultz family and stating the most heartbreaking of all is to hear your son describe that he contemplated taking his life because he felt abandoned, isolated, threatened, and hopeless for doing the right thing. That's the cost it had on the whistleblowers. One did take his own life because of these lies. It goes through the procedural history and the sentencing calculations. The PSR calculates the total offense level as follows. Base offense level, 
seven. Specific offense characteristics, loss of more than 550 million plus 30. Offense involving 10 or more victims plus two. This is the government math on the side here. Offense involving consciousness or reckless risk of death or serious bodily injury. That's for just saying whatever if the blood tests don't work plus two. Adjustment for role in the offense plus four. Like you're the boss. So plus four. So seven plus 30 plus two plus two plus four. Total offense level 43. Footnote one. The guidelines provide an offense level of more than 43 is to be treated as an offense level of 43. Holmes falls within the criminal history uh, criminal history category I, thus for an offense level of 43, because the guidelines are literally like a uh, like a chart of fuck around and find out. They're like a, a chart where you go with the access and try to find it. Um, Holmes falls within criminal history category I, thus for an offense level of 43, the guidelines recommend a sentence beyond the statutory maximum of 80 years. The PSR recommends that the court vary from the guidelines and impose a sentence of 108 months. Hey Siri, how many years is 108 months? 108 months is nine years. Nine? Well, that's unacceptable. Siri likes being part of the show. We've got to we've got to keep Siri involved. Thanks, Siri. The PSR sentencing recommendation um, P1. The government agrees that the PSR accurately calculates the offense level. Home, ob Holmes objects to the application of certain adjustments. The government thus addresses them in turn. They're arguing about the loss. They're saying that the loss isn't that high. Um, let's see. They're arguing that the offense doesn't involve 10 or more victims. Um, that's from Holmes's camp. Let's see. Offense involving consciousness or reckless risk of death or serious bodily injury. Defendant's conduct created a risk of serious harm to patients. I agree. Let's see. Um, Holmes's treatment of Theranos patients is relevant conduct. I agree. Holmes is arguing, well, she didn't do it. She didn't do it. So. Um... It did say 180 before. It did. I think 108 might be a typo. I thought it was 18 years too. Hey Siri, well, we'll get we'll get there. Cancel. We'll come back to you. I found some web results. No, cancel. I can show them if you ask again. No, your girl, we're good. We'll come back to you in a minute. Um, we're gonna get down to the end where it should be corrected. So let's see. Holmes's actions directed towards Sarah's patients are undoubtedly part of the same course or conduct. So they're saying, look the patients can't be discounted. Holmes's role of the offense was like the tip of the spear. She was the leader. Um, let's see. The fraud was otherwise extensive. It involved years and lots of people and lots of things. It wasn't just one statement one time. This was an ongoing pattern of criminal behavior and conduct, even when others were telling her it's criminal conduct and a criminal pattern of behavior. Government recommendation. The factors the court should consider in determining the appropriate sentence include the nature of the circumstances of the offense, the need for the sentence to reflect the seriousness of the offense, etc. Holmes's total offense level 43 in criminal history category I yield a sentence in zone D. Zone D sentences shall be satisfied with a custodial sentence prison. The applicable sentencing custody range is capped at 960 months imprisonment. This range assumes a sentence of 240 months imprisonment, the statutory maximum. Hey, Siri, how long is 240 months in years? 240 months is 20 years. 20 years. This range assumes a sentence of 20 years. Would be imposed for each of the four counts run consecutively. So they're asking for the assumption of 240 months each of the four counts running consecutively, one after the other. Considering the extensiveness of Holmes's fraud, the sentencing factors support a sentence of 180 months imprisonment as it would reflect the seriousness of the offense, promote respect for the law, provide for just punishment and offenses, and deter Holmes and others. Hey Siri, how long is 180 months in years? 180 months is 15 years. 15. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so they're saying the... Applicable custodial range is capped at 80 years, but they're asking for 15 years. She is asking for 18 months. 
where's the, let's get to the restitution. So the government's asking for 15 years and restitution. They go through all the different sentencing factors. I'm interested to see what the judge says. During her trial testimony, the following exchange occurred during her cross-examination. Question. Okay. And holding a patent does not necessarily mean the invention described in the patent works. Correct? Answer. Yes. For example, you don't have an ingestible pill that enables you to measure lipids in the blood. Correct? Not yet. Approaching sentencing, this course cannot be confident that Holmes has been deterred from future fraud. Therefore, the court must deter future criminal fraud, especially in the healthcare space, by Holmes through a significant custodial sentence. Um, let's see. Furthermore, a review of certain specific sentences imposed in similar cases demonstrate the wide range of custodial sentences imposed in large dollar fraud cases. While each case is different, there is a uh, precedent for courts to impose significant custody sentences in white collar crimes. Um, Charles W. McCall, McKeeson, approximate loss amount $8.6 billion, 120 months of custody, no cooperation. Walter Forbes, more than $1 billion, 151 months, no cooperation. So when you're looking at why people commit crimes, this is part of it. Look at these sentences. These sentences are wild and low. Um, my, I was, I was reading, and my mods alerted me to a super chat in a in a very generous amount. Um, thank you so much, Mister Okerman. That is that is incredibly and tremendously generous. Thank you, uh, thank you. So there is no question, but if you have a question, put it in, and the uh, the mods will the mods will get to it. We're gonna keep looking at this fraud chart here. Because, uh, yeah, yeah. This is a great question from Jessica. Could the judge give more than what the prosecution is asking for? Yes. Yes. Catherine Frazier said, my darling girl is so brilliant. She will change the world. She wants to help. She is vegan. Yes. Um, it's okay, Judy. We appreciate you. Look, liking and subscribing is, is super helpful. 18 months needs an enhancement. It does. How much is her house, house worth? It won't matter because it is not in her name. She is living with her partner. She probably has nothing in her name. But if you're looking at why do people do shit like this, it's because the punishment is so low in comparison. More than a billion dollars from Walter A. Forbes, <clears throat> 151 months. More than 100 million, 204 months. Um, more than a hundred million, 144 months. Bernard Ebers, more than a billion, 300 months. Sanjay Kumar, um, more than 400 million, 144 months. Jeffrey Skilling, more than 80 million, 168 months. Um, Samuel Cohen, 31 million, 264 months. Um, Ibrahim United, United Commercial Bank Chief Credit Officer, 677 million, 97 months. <coughs> then the others, 45 million, 140 months, 45 million, 130 months, 47 million, 100 months. So then they go through the Victims Restitution Act. The court should order homes to pay restitution as described below. Let's see what they say. Um, Based on the PSR, it appears that Holmes has modest assets outweighed by $450,000 loans uh, in loans for SEC settlement and a liability for legal fees in excess of $30 million. Liability for legal fees in excess of $30 million. The PSR notes it is not unknown whether any third parties, guarantors, or others are also liable on or expected to pay legal fees. The PSR also notes that Holmes's family appears to have substantial assets and that Holmes is managing her affairs to avoid subjecting their assets to any judgment in this case. Before 
foregoing a fine, the court should assure itself that such liabilities are current and genuine and consider whether Holmes's management of her affairs, moving money, her moving money, reflects a genuine desire to make her investors whole. For these reasons, the government recommends the court sentence the defendant to 180 months in custody and order her to pay $803 million in restitution and a $400 special assessment. So, with that, the loss to Walgreens, Safeway, and George Schultz is over $800 million. They're asking for 15 years, and uh, we will see. The defense, we're going to go to real quick, and then I'm going to have to bounce off. I was hoping for more time for questions today, and I'm like, shit, we might not have more time for questions today. Um, but I got a little bit of time. Look, we leave a buffer so we can eat, and then we end up not using our buffer and then not eating, but it's okay. I have snacks. I have snacks on my desk. Um, That was the government sentencing. Let's look at Holmes's real quick, and then we'll look at the reply real, real, real fast, like real, real fast. Holmes's sentencing memorandum in motion for downward departure. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know what the government's asking for. We know what the pre-sentencing report says but we would like you to go down from that. Don't sentence to more. Go down for that. So, um, Skoda asked, is this a RICO case? No, this was just a wire fraud case. They did not charge racketeering in this case. Just wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Holmes's personal history, childhood, college, CEO of Theranos, relationship with Bawani, current family life, volunteer work, personal characteristics, deep interest in making the world a better place. Caring and reliable friend, advisor and mentor, intelligent and a visionary. She's so smart. It's just business. No one understands. Businessy business, business, business. So smart. Y'all just don't understand. It's not fraud. You just don't understand our math. That's all. We're on another level. Positive impact on others. I would like to know the positive impact. Calculation of the sentencing guidelines and range. Holmes objects to the PSR's calculations of loss. No, it wasn't that much loss. We didn't do that much damage. It wasn't as bad as all that. Um, let's see. Each investor and associated loss must be considered separately. On and on and on. Gain to Miss Holmes as an alternative measure. If the court accepts the PSR calculation of loss, a downward departure is warranted under section 2B1.1, application note 2C. And then there's some stuff that is um is redacted. Holmes's personal history and characteristics strongly support leniency. What characteristics strongly support leniency? that she wants to do good in the world. I think that supports the sentence that she won't stop because she thinks she's right and everyone else is wrong. She had every opportunity to do this legally. Every opportunity of money, advantage, education, every opportunity, every opportunity to do this right. And she did not. I don't think saying that she had every opportunity and intends well should be used to downward depart. <sighs> All right, let's just take a quick, quick, hopefully they summarize it and then we'll jump to the summary. Elizabeth Holmes stands before the court having been convicted of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and three individual counts of wire fraud with respect to certain sophisticated investors. Your Honor, the investors are sophisticated. They should have understood. So really, it's not her fault. It's their fault. See, she just wants to do good in the world. Her investors were sophisticated. They should have known she was lying. 
In sentencing her, the court's task is a heavy one. Ms. Holmes was 19 when she founded her company, her first business experience. Who has that opportunity? We've already gone through that. In 2010, the beginning of the charge period, she was 25 and turned 26. What were y'all doing at 25, 26? I was a district attorney working. I was not a child. And when her company shut down in 2018, she was just 34 years old. It's a full ass adult in my book. She founded and built Theranos for indisputably good reasons. She worked tirelessly along with hundreds of brilliant and committed employees, except the ones she threatened, to improve access to affordable health information, a valid cause. The company achieved incredibly valuable inventions, or the company achieved incredibly valuable inventions, which, for which the United States government is still issuing patents as recently of July of this year, for what? She suffered substantial trauma throughout the time period of the offense. Tell me more about your trauma. Tell me more about your trauma. Tell me more about your trauma. I'm not going to bore you all talking about my trauma. I'm not going to ask you all to disclose your trauma. Tell me more about your trauma. You have not had it harder than everyone else that excuses your crimes. Take your green smoothie and fuck right off with all of that. When criticisms arose, she committed fully to identifying, acknowledging, and fixing the errors. That's exactly what those texts sounded like to me. She never cashed out. She went down with the ship when her company failed. It's noble, your honor. She went down with the ship. Noble. And regardless of the sentence the court imposes for the rest of her life, she and her family will be punished. As her partner knows all too well, there is no avoiding the scorn that accompanies Elizabeth Holmes. Among the countless people in our society who do not know Elizabeth Holmes yet think they know about her case from the unusually intense media coverage of it, Ms. Holmes, you have a support group like you Daryl Brooks, Amber Heard, start a support group for how mean the internet's been to you. Ms. Holmes has become a character and has been mocked and vilified. I wonder if Amber Heard thinks that Elizabeth Holmes has been mocked and vilified. I would love to know their thoughts on one another. That would be fascinating. The court has the opportunity and obligation here to look beyond that caricature as it has throughout this case, and examine Ms. Holmes as a human being. Everyone who comes before the criminal justice system should absolutely be treated as an individual. Um, yeah, and Jesse Smollett, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, everyone who gets pulled before the court by the government should be treated as a human being. That I agree with. I mean, she did lose her stocks, people. It's It's very difficult. It's very difficult. More than 130 individuals who actually know Ms. Holmes have written to the court to help in that process. Among them are friends, families, enablers. I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. <clears throat> My bad. Theranos investors, Theranos board members, and former employees who served in a variety of roles at Theranos, all of whom submit these letters despite the risk that they will be criticized for their support. I think that's fair. They might be. They might be criticized for their support of her. I think that's fair. They might be. These are people who know Miss Holmes and her character. Yes, her partner called her a zealot. Let's just reflect on that for a moment. These are the people who know Miss Holmes, her character, remorse, and capacity to do good. The real Elizabeth Holmes is a compassionate friend who is there for people around her to support, comfort, cheer on, problem solve, and connect. That's so different than what her family said. Her family said that she was distant and that with Bawani, she had distanced herself from all of them. And her brother said in his letter that they barely shared a handful of meals together in five years. 
But tell me more about how she's a compassionate friend that's there for the people around her. The real Elizabeth Holmes is a friend who writes letters that I still keep and read again anytime I need to be reminded of my purpose and inner strength. The real Elizabeth Holmes is a devoted mother who turns ordinary moments into magical experience, magical experiences of unbound love and wonder for her son. The real Elizabeth Holmes is extremely genuine, giving, and selfless. Unlike anyone else I've met in Silicon Valley, the real Elizabeth Holmes was an approachable, attentive, and supportive, employee-focused CEO. Don't tell them about the fraud. The real Elizabeth Holmes faced the challenges at Theranos from 2016 to 2018 with steadfast ethical principles. Y'all... No, she like forged documents, right? Like forged documents to investors, right? Right? <sighs> Sorry. It was the steadfast ethical principles for me. Steadfast eth ethical principles, complete dedication to what was best for Theranos, and admirable courage. The real Elizabeth Holmes is driven by single and simple purpose. She wants to make the world a better place than it would have been without her. And she is going to drag you along with her on her vision quest while lying to investors, the federal government, and saying, fuck off, regulators. Who needs you peons? You're so annoying with your rules. You don't see the vision. Sorry, that was... That was a that was a bit much. That was a bit that was a bit much. I I, I apologize. That was a bit that was a bit over the over the top. That was a bit over the top. The real Elizabeth Holmes has within her a sincere desire to help others. Mm, it might be called a religious fervor to be a, of meaningful service and possess the capacity to redeem herself. Y'all, she's going to be like running an MLM in prison. I tell you what, she is going to be running an MLM in prison. She is going to be like, ladies, the green juice, we're going to do yoga. You're going to like it. You're going to better yourselves. I can see it. The real Elizabeth Holmes is driven by a single simple purpose. She wants to make the world a better place than it would have been without her. The victim's family's just barfed in their mouth a little bit. The real Elizabeth Holmes has within her a sincere desire to help others, to be of meaningful service, and possess the capacity to redeem herself. And everyone deserves, everyone deserves that chance. However, I think with this, there needs to be some caution. Mm -hmm. She's going to be selling shampoo. Section 3553 requires the court to fashion a sentence significant but not greater than necessary. The court's difficult task is to look beyond these surface level views. Hold on, let's get to what the surface level views are. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. If a period of confinement is necessary, if the defense suggests that a term of 18 months or less with a subsequent supervision release period that requires community service will amply meet that charge. But the defense believes that home confinement with a requirement that Ms. Holmes continue her current work is sufficient. So wait, you want her to just work from home comfortably with her family? You would like her to just work from home. We acknowledge that this may seem a tall order given the public perception of this case. Oh, it's y'all. Y'all are wrong. Y'all are wrong for your perception. Especially when Ms. Holmes is viewed as a caricature, not the person. We read her texts. When the company is viewed as a house of cards, not as ambitious, innovative, indisputably valuable enterprise that it was, 
and when the media vitriol for Miss Holmes is taken into account. The media vitriol? They lauded her with no evidence. The, the, the media was fanning her ass and telling her how great she was. She sat down with presidents and former presidents. They toured her lab. What media vitriol? Show me the media vitriol because I still haven't seen it. She and Amber Heard might have the same PR team at this point. Is blame the media and social media the new thing? Just blame the media and social media? But the media. But the court's difficult task is to look beyond these surface level views when it fashions its sentence. The court's going to look to exactly what the fuck it saw in court. They saw her testify. In doing so, we ask the court to consider as it must the real person, the real company, and the complex circumstances surrounding the offense conduct. It's venture capital, bro. You just don't understand. You're just a federal judge. It's not like you have investments because those would be conflicts. I mean, you just don't understand how hard it is to be rich. You have to move money around. You have to get VC. You don't put your own money in. And then at the end of the day, you lose your stocks. It's traumatizing. the complex circumstances surrounding the offense conduct and the important principle that no defendant should be made a martyr to public passion. I agree with that 100%. I agree. No defendant should be made a martyr to public passion. I, I agree. It, But I don't think the government is outlandishly asking for too much. As discussed in more details in the pages that follow, this is a unique case, and this defendant is a singular human with much to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. They go through personal history, which we sadly do not have time for today because I do have to bounce. She was a studious and hardworking child. She has, as her mother describes, a gritty determination. I don't think that helps you in sentencing. The I'm going to make it happen come hell or high water is why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. As a teenager, she poured that curiosity into schoolwork and extracurriculars, such as spending time, <clears throat> spending part of her Saturdays taking Chinese lessons from the time she was a preteen. Y'all, she learned another language. For everyone who's not in the United States, I know that you might see this as a normal part of your life and not a feat to be lauded in the sentencing, sentencing, sentencing memo. But apparently a, you know, American deigning to learn another language is worthy of applause and a lighter sentence. Y'all are like, this is 82 pages. It is. We're not going through all of it. So, Ms. Holmes began attending college at Stanford University in fall of 2002. Consistent with her lifelong interest in science, Holmes focused on chemical engineering with an eye towards combating several engineering or combining several engineering disciplines. She brought to those difficult classes her deep work ethic and sound moral compass. As her college friend Lauren Statt describes, Ms. Holmes insisted that there was no need to rely on study groups who had inherited the answers to problem sets, quote, those relics of dubious morality. And so with her leadership, we proceeded to learn the right way, the hard way. Wait, is there just a cheating ring at Stanford that you just pass on the problem sets? Because I feel like once you reach a certain level in our society, people just hand you the answers to things. I mean, is that not the way that works? Just, okay. Tell me more about Stanford. I'm curious. Um, Ms. Holmes started auditioning, auditing, sorry, graduate level courses and working in the laboratory of Professor Channing Robertson, where she was part of a team developing microfluidic sensors. Maybe she should have stayed there for a while. Ms. Holmes also enjoyed the social aspects of college life, including the friends she made there. 
Her mother describes that in her regular calls, she was full of joy and enthusiasm about life, as you should be when you're getting to do what you love, study, and not worry about anything else. You get to just be surrounded by people that are studying the same thing you're studying. Oh, shoot, I do. I have to go. Um, thank you, Miguelina, for reminding me. This is talking about our time at Theranos. I'm going to zoom, zoom till we get to their recommendation. I mean, we've already seen their calling for 18 months and working at home. Um, and then we will go through this more. But the judge sentence here, let me just wrap this. Let me go to the, con are all the letters attached to this? If all the letters are attached to this, I will just make this available. I'm zoom, zooming too fast. Um, let me just jump to the end and see if all the letters are attached, if y'all want to read them. Mm, Cause I know they should, mm, nope. I'll find the letters and I'll attach it. And then I'll share that on Twitter. Um, and I'll share a link on Instagram as well and share some of these out. If you guys want to read them, I'm sorry, I didn't get to finish them. They are substantial in length. Suffice it to say the government is asking for, um, 15 years and 800 million. And the defense is asking that she gets to work from home. I think that she will get prison. I do not think she will get, um, I do not think she will get 15 years. I think it will be lower than that. I think that it will be, um, I think that it will be, I think it will be above 18 months in custody. I think that that's low for the amount of this, but it's going to depend on how I think some of how the judge, how offended the judge is by all of this and how the judge perceived her when she testified. She testified for days and days and days. And so the judge will get some perception of their, of, of Holmes's characteristics and whether or not she's learned, whether or not she is, um, remorseful or whether she's like, this was all a big whoopsie doodle. It's not really fraud. Y'all just don't understand me. And the people around me lied. It's not my fault because that is going to factor into her being sentenced more. Jacqueline B asked, are you going to be there tomorrow for the sentencing? No, I will not be in California tomorrow for the sentencing. I'm going to have to rely on reports and I will tell you guys who I am following around for reports tomorrow. And I will let you know in the afternoon when we hear. So um, this is a massive fraud. I don't think it got a ton of media attention. I have not seen vitriol on the media about Elizabeth Holmes. I've not seen a ton of people talking about it. My my coverage of Elizabeth Holmes does not get nearly as much um, pickup as it does uh, when I cover other topics. I have not seen the level of vitriol towards her at all. People still dressed up like her for Halloween. People dressed up, the fangirl dressed up to her as her um, at the beginning of court. We have seen some of the media saying that it's unfair, that this is misogyny. Um, that seems like a, that seems like a, uh, that seems like a media go-to at the moment, that she's not being treated the same as a, as a man would be. We'll see what the sentence is between her and Balwani. But I think if the judge wants to prove that misogyny is not alive and well, she should be treated the same as male CEOs in her position. Um, and she should not be sentenced lighter because she is a female. I don't think we should assume that she was less in control of this company because she is a female. I think that would be the misogyny in this case is assuming that Sonny Balwani was in charge of her because he is a man and she is a woman. And I think the judge um, doesn't need to doesn't need to say that, but I think she should be treated on par with other CEOs that oversaw massive and detrimental frauds. I think that is fair. So we will see what the judge decides to do tomorrow. I will keep you posted on social media. To all of you um, who super chatted, I appreciate the support. I do. I am sorry that I did not get to all of them. I always try. I know the mods always let you know that we might not. But I do see them and I do go through, if I don't get to read them all, I do go through um, and read them after the streams because I do appreciate you supporting me and the channel. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to point this out. The, the movie Dope Sick shows how the opioid addiction crisis started in the boardroom of Purdue Pharma. Great movie. Michael Keaton was awesome. I know when we talk about some of these frauds that, that are allowed, it's wild. Um... Tag said military works 24 seven and are paid at poverty level. Yes. This whole, they worked hard, um, is, is kind of ridiculous to me. Truly. 
I worked at a motel as the overnight front desk being four, eight, I was still able to break up and kick out parties, partiers, disrupting everyone. The only fight of two, six foot guys that I got pushed out of and got help made $3 an hour. Jules, good for you for holding it down. It must have just been. It must have just been. Um, 18, shelf stacker at a library. I hated the students. I can understand that. My first job was McDonald's dating myself during the hilarious, uh, during the, oh, during the hillside strangler, no cell phones. Very scary. Plus very hard uh, job. Had to call when I left. Had to call when I got home 16 years of age. Peggy Cole, that would have been terrifying for not just you and your parents. Like, how are we getting to and from safely? Um, not a concern. Some happy news. Amazon just delivered my orders of Ruffles All Dress Chips. I need to make a new order for Ruffles All Dress Chips. They're so freaking good. They take some time to get here from Canada, though. Um, Malleus Maximus. We must cast an eye on the enablers. I've been through due diligence rounds. They put a microscope to things. How could investors put this much in without doing effective due diligence? Seems they don't care if it's a, um, I think, fungazi, as long as they can maintain plausible deniability. There might be some of that, but some of them were actively misled. So there is some of that too. When you go through John Kerry Rue's reporting, some of them were actively misled in their due diligence. Same argument used to defend every Ponzi scheme since Ponzi himself. You just don't understand how these things work. Guess what I do understand? Being lied to and stealing money. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, Roy said, I got 99 problems, but a giant estate ain't, ain't one right. Nobody's getting lost in that um, for me either. Hi, Emily. I'm from Belgium. Can you put the link that we can donate for the victims family of the uh, Daryl Brooks. And thank you for your covers. Uh, you're welcome. And I put some up. I put the links that we have verified in those streams, in the descriptions to donate to the city. I am going to look for the ones directly to the families. I just have not verified those for myself yet. And I will be doing that. So they will go up and then I will also be making a donation on behalf of our community from um, Super Chat and ad revenue if, if the content claim gets released off of yesterday's video, I will be adding that one too. So we, um, we have to deal with a quick copyright issue because sometimes the media doesn't understand that they don't own the copyright of these public proceedings. So once that is released, we will be good. I know Fugazi is a band too. <laughs> Thank you all. I let's see. Jen said they strapped Daryl to a wheelchair today. Um, I I believe he was back in court today uh, for the other thing. If I didn't have an interview today, I would cover it. I do have an interview, um, but I will give my thoughts on it in a short or a real later later today because I do have an interview that I have to go do. So I appreciate all of you for being here. I probably would have streamed another hour because this was fascinating, and I think we all needed to decompress at the beginning with glorious mugs. We just did. We just did. We just needed to decompress. So I appreciate all of you. I will see you soon. The video episode of the podcast will be up later today. The audio episode is up for you. The All the facts, hats, and the new merch and the zip-ups, which have been very popular, are over at lawnerdshop.com. That sale is ongoing to celebrate three years of the podcast. So if you are a law nerd, you want to get yourself something for the holidays, now is the time for it to get here in time. Once we get into early December, our shipping times, I worry, will push just based on the um, amount. So if you want to make sure you get your merch early and timely, go do that now. And I will see you later. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being a honored. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Bye. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.